Yo, what's up? We about to do this. And I was about to just do a talk. And then I realized there's a dude over here on Twitter talking smack. Can you believe it? A person on Twitter trying to trying to talk some? No, uh, nobody on Twitter would be talking smack. That, uh, uh. Wait a minute. Did I not set the right time? Right. There we go. So why is it not letting me start my Twitter space? That doesn't make any sense. Is that for the wrong day? What is today? 25th. We got to get these people up in here. There we go. Arguing. You're so mean. Why do you just do the, all these debates? Why do you do this? This is just... There's a problem with you. I mean, I come out of a... Milieu. Of studying philosophy in the university. And when I was studying philosophy, even in the... 2000s I mean it was still encouraged that you debate your ideas and you have them challenged I mean that was still in the phase when 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 there was still such a thing as debate club so we still had debate at that time which as you know hopefully in this audience right that's part of classical education that's part of a well-formed well-educated individual has the ability to engage with different ideas now as we know this society is unfortunately dumbed down not educated brainwashed but there is the appearance of education and so we are dominated by suits everywhere and the problem with the suit is that it's all about appearances it's all about the way things appear to be the appearance of education the appearance of knowledge the appearance of wisdom the appearance of whatever online versus reality versus what's actually the case which is typically not real education right and i know that there's no easy solution to that we're not we don't have any pie in the sky uh, solutions over here because i'm well aware of the realities of the situation so today we're going to have open forum and i'm going to give you guys the link for the debate uh, but it's going to be a little bit different today today i want to include the topic of theism so here's the twitter space link if you want to join the debate if you want to come in and ask your questions there's the link right there i'll also add it to the show description so the mods can put it in there if somebody wants to call in I'm going to make a few points at the beginning to help kind of lay out my take on a lot of this stuff and tie it into the red pill and all that because it's still, you know, everywhere. It's the hot topic, as we know, even though others are now saying, oh, the red pill is imploding, you know, this kind of stuff, whatever. But as Rolo correctly points out, a lot of this stuff comes in phases, cycles, and waves. And so right now we're at the phase where the talking points will transition into election uh, culture war stuff as we approach the next election cycle. And as you know, over here, you know, we don't really care about all this low tier, low IQ football politics election stuff. If it's relevant to what we talk about, it might come up. I might talk about it, but there's a few points we're going to make and then we're going to open it up because there's a guy talking smack on Twitter and I'm hopefully he'll come. But just a lack of education that people have and they, they just, everyone talks so confidently and so matter of factly and everyone on, everyone knows it all. They know it all. And sometimes there's a rare person that does know what they're talking about. I mean, I can usually find these diamonds in the rough after a little bit of inquiry, a little bit of conversation, right? A little bit of reading what they're talking about. AJ today had a great tweet. He really nailed it. He pointed out that in the libertarian ethos, 
they'll never have an adequate response or an answer to the culture war, the culture crisis, precisely because libertarianism is defined as a negative liberty position. That's its historical ethos. That's its origins. We can go into all of these figures. I know it very well. Uh, I've got all my classical liberals here right beside me. And the whole thing is premised on the dialectics of the Enlightenment. But it's only as good as the presuppositions of the Enlightenment itself is or are. Now, some of the ideas of the Enlightenment can be true without the materialistic assumptions of the Enlightenment being the case. The empiricist, materico critico presuppositions of the presumption of the Enlightenment are not necessarily true because this or that Enlightenment philosopher has an insight. For example, Kantian insights about transcendental categories don't prove or necessitate the, the entire system of Kantianism is true, including Kant's arguments for world government. Yes, he's an argument for world government. We'll look at that in a minute. He has a whole essay on it. But that's not just the Kantian idea. It's also an idea that many of the classical liberals argued for. And it may be true that some of the classical liberal theorists and, and ec economists uh, didn't go wholesale in this direction, like the guy who's arguing with me today that, oh, you're not uh, accurately giving the true libertarian perspective because you've ignored uh, von Mises and whoever. And you talked about von Hayek. Well, first of all, this is supposed to, this assumes that there is a orthodox, true libertarianism. I'm not convinced that there is such a thing. Maybe you can convince me of that. And we were doing debates with libertarians six, seven years ago publicly with all the same talking points. Remember the Robert Taylor debates on praxis, praxeology. We had to hear about that for hours and hours and hours. And when it came to basic questions of what those words mean, how words work as reference and symbols and signifiers and what he's even talking about, it all immediately collapsed. Why? Well, it ties into what I argued the other day on uh, my analysis of the pros and cons of the red pill. I know, Rothbard, I know, Milton Friedman. Like, who's the real authentic libertarian? Okay, I, if you, here's the point I'm trying to make. When we get to the presuppositions of all enlightenment thought and philosophy... And if we determine whether those are correct or false, it's not going to matter the internecine disputes of this or that Lolbertarian theorist. I don't really care. I mean, okay, maybe there's some insight that one or, one of these guys has. Okay, fine. But it's all going to be premised on presuppositions of the Enlightenment, which are not questioned. And... The critiques that we've been making over here going back seven, eight, nine, ten years ago on this channel and in my essays dealt with things like metaphysics. I mean, all Enlightenment philosophy for the most part, unless we want to talk about the reaction against Enlightenment Western liberal philosophers from the continental philosophers, Western liberal philosophy is Enlightenment in its ethos, meaning it's going to share the commonalities, the presuppositions of John Locke, David Hume, David Ricardo, Adam Smith, uh, any of the laissez-faire theorists of this time, on and on and on, Immanuel Kant as well. And to be in that ethos, you're going to have certain presuppositions or else you're not a classical liberal. So it's not that hard to figure this out. It's not that controversial when we talk about this stuff. And 95% of what we might class as the, how do we, I don't even know how to classify this. Let's just say the entire alternative media sphere. Let's say everything ranging from uh, Daily Wire to Jordan Peterson to um, Red Pill People, for the most part, um, and even most of the so-called conspiracy world. It's almost all premised on enlightenment, classical liberalism. Now, 
some years ago, we had this ridiculous alt-right, quote-unquote, movement, which attempted at times to criticize this. And that, of course, all fell apart because its premises were typically, I don't know, Nietzschean. I don't even know what we would call what that was. But, you know, something Nietzschean, basically. And that's only going to be as good as Nietzsche or whatever other atheistic presuppositions that we had. So basically, here's the thrust of what I'm arguing and what, what I've made a key element of critique of all these people for at least 10 years now, maybe more, maybe more. I mean, I, I, I gave up classical liberalism a long time ago. I mean, I read critiques of this stuff in my early 20s. So that's 20 years ago. That doesn't mean that I don't like and appreciate elements of classical liberalism. For example, private property. Sure. Owning a business. Having sovereignty of my own assets and wealth. Sure, okay. But is that synonymous with classical liberalism? No, it's not. Is classical liberalism defined as what this guy is arguing with me today? Uh, free market transactions. Well, I guess if you think of man essentially as homo economicus, then that is how you would define define liberty and freedom. Right? It's it's economic and it's referent. But is man only a transactional exchange homo economicus being? Right, which was a critique of Spangler against all this stuff. Well, that's going to depend on your presuppositions, isn't it? And what do we see? I see two commonalities amongst, for the most part, the classical liberal spectrum and the red pill spectrum. And those two common out, and there are a couple outliers and what we talked about them last time, and I'll mention them again. The two commonalities are, number one, when we get into the so-called thinkers of the intellectual dark web, the uh, dissident media, the tradcon sphere. They are typically also couched within classical liberalism. You may not critique or question the assumptions of classical liberalism. Thus far and no further. Thus, it's anti-metaphysical in its stance by necessity. Why? Because it is the child of the Enlightenment. An Enlightenment philosophy from Locke to Berkeley to Hume to Kant is premised on an anti-metaphysic stance. Now, for those of you that are slow boys, don't know what I'm talking about, I am not talking about the Barnes & Noble witchcraft section. I'm not talking about the uh, astrology uh Figure out your tantric uh, inner principle sound waves from Raven, uh, uh, Tushy Ravenstar or whoever other bunch of nonsense that you might get when you Google metaphysics. I'm talking about the classical definition of the study of being or existence, ontology, etc., one of the disciplines of philosophy. What are the three disciplines of philosophy? Ethics, metaphysics, epistemology. Ethics being our choices of right and wrong, our morals, our values. By the way, value judgments, you can see they easily also presuppose and overlap with metaphysics. They're not identical per se, but they have overlap. For example, if we talk about ethics, we're immediately embroiled in making value judgments. This is better than that. Okay, on what standard? On the basis of good versus evil. Guess what? Good versus evil. The good, the true, they're also metaphysical statements. They're statements about our ideals, what is the good, etc. Those are metaphysical questions. How do we live in terms of right and wrong? That's an ethical question. And then, as you can see, the true versus the false, well, that's not just ethics and metaphysics. Because we're asking what is truth itself that makes it metaphysical we can also ask about how do we know it's true then immediately we're in the domain of epistemology so you see the three domains of philosophy overlap 
presuppose and relate directly to one another necessarily. Now, when we get to the Enlightenment, what we have, and I just covered this in the whole History of Western Philosophy course that we did over at Richard Grove's site, you can go to uh, the link in the show description to get the link for the per to purchase the Western Philosophy course. One of the things that we saw is that in this historical conversation from the pre-Socratics up until the Enlightenment, what we have is an assumption that metaphysics is preeminent in philosophy. We begin with our metaphysics, and then later on we might ask ethical questions or perhaps even epistemic questions. But typically, the ancient medieval philosophers didn't focus on ethics and metaphysics. They did discuss them. But metaphysics was, excuse me, ethics and epistemology. They were kind of, be, they were kind of givens. In the Enlightenment, post-Descartes, what we have is a revolution in thought and in questioning. Even though Descartes' system was kind of platonic and pretty much dualistic and still heavily metaphysical, Descartes asked the question that launches what you could say is a Copernican shift or an ideological shift in thought and in philosophy. When he talks about how do I have indubitable certitude? So you get this in the meditations, for example. And Descartes thinks, well, I'll begin with my mind, right? I think, therefore I am. I'm a thinking being, thus I must in some way have existence to be a thinking being. And even though the uh, Enlightenment philosophers after Descartes are taken up with this question, they go further. They shift the question and say, hey, wait a minute. No, actually, Descartes asking the right question, but this is showing us that we need to turn this on its head and realize that before we can talk about metaphysics and what exists and being and all this kind of stuff, we're going to have to ask the question of how do we have knowledge to begin with? And this is why we get a shift to the empiricist tradition. It had predecessors. It wasn't out of a vacuum. William of Ockham, Gabriel Bile. There are medieval and late medieval nominalists. And nominalists are people who questioned the reality or the existence of the status of universals. So the dominance of this idea of the transcendent and universal categories and being, etc., metaphysical topics that were really prevalent throughout the Middle Ages, that's beginning to crumble. It's crumbling because the shift is happening away from metaphysics towards epistemology. So the Enlightenment philosophers are preoccupied with the epistemic question of how do I know? What can I know? What are the organs by which humans know? Is man a tabula rasa? Does he have innate knowledge? Tabula rasa means a blank slate. Is man like a little camcorder? Can I know universals? Maybe I can only know immediate empirical sense data facts. This is the shift. So between... <clears throat> Locke, Berkeley, Hume, and Kant, the Anglo-empiricists, the Western world essentially flips. Now, it's true that not totally, because you do have some of the continental philosophers, some of the people in German idealism, they, they don't fully go along with this. Uh, now, I don't think that they're really giving us, in the long run, positions that are a whole lot better, but they don't fully go along with this revolution and not too long after this we get the revolutions in physics right we get newtonianism and and i would argue one of the best enlightenment philosophers who metaphysically has some actually good insights is actually the one that's the most overlooked and laughed at and that's leibniz so if we did want to find an enlightenment philosopher who's, who's actually pretty good it would be somebody like Leibniz, but no, the whole Western world is told that we have to wa we have to worship essentially Locke, Berkeley, uh, Kant, and Hume. And I want to be again precise here that that does not mean that each of these philosophers can't have insights, but having insights is not equivalent to me accepting wholesale their presuppositions and their system and their worldview because they have that. 
And again, you will hear us often making a transcendental argument. Well, Kant makes transcendental arguments, so you're a Kantian. No. If I make an argument from ideas, does that make, make me an idealist? If I produce information from empirical sense data, does that make me an empiricist? No. This is silly. So likewise, I'm not saying that everything Kant says or that everything that Hume or any of these people say is completely wrong. So I'm being very charitably nuanced, brother. Charitably nuanced. So, classical liberal issues that I think miss the mark, blind spots, where they can't go any further. They get... They can take you so far, and then it's that's it. So will classical liberals, are they effective in criticizing tyranny and Marxism and socialism uh, in today's order? Absolutely. Yeah, sure. And again, there's a spectrum here of, you know, our buddies like uh, Richard Grove, right? Richard is, uh, I would say, situated in the, the classical liberal camp. Good friends of ours. We love Richard. So this is not an attack on anybody personally, right? Lord Voldemort classical liberal and the the ideas of liberty and equality before law and rule of law the, all of these kinds of things i don't have a problem with any of those things sure but again here's the thing classical liberalism is premised on the rejection of metaphysics and a thus a non-transcendent view of man the presupposition being that man is then an economic being or a social being determined by something like the social contract, right? And it's premised on the idea that there's not actually historic uh, authority. So it's kind of bound up in many ways with Protestantism as well. The idea that there's not any divine right of kings and there's not any divine right of ecclesial authority. Those are presuppositions I think we could say are also shared amongst the Enlightenment philosophers. Hence, why Kant, for example, in his treatise Arguing for World Government, basically says, you'll notice here, the law of nations shall be founded on a federation of free states. So we want a law of nations that's a federation, a world federation. And does that mean, oh, so uh, a democracy and a kingdom and an imperium? No, no, no. No, what does Kant say? Every civil constitution shall be a republic. So what we have here is a republican platonic idea of the state, or even Aristotelian, you could argue, because they both kind of have this similar principles. I know that Aristotle's polis is not identical to... Uh, Plato's ideal city-state, but the Greek tradition, you could argue, okay, so it's kind of Republican, right? Plato's Republic, right? But exactly what a Republic is, that that differs even in Plato, right? Because early Plato, we got a philosopher king in the Republic, and then in the laws, we have a basically a shadow government, literally. So people are like, there ain't no such thing as conspiracies. Oh, the most famous book in the history of Western civilization, the Republic, actually says that the elite should govern by the noble lie and through secret societies. Oh, so there's no such thing as conspiracy, even though the most famous document says that basically society should be structured around a deep state. Okay, so you just basically demonstrate they have no knowledge of the founding documents of Western civilization, including Plato's Republic. Plato's laws later say, now let's make it an oligarchy of uh, ele uh, elders who meet secretly at night and... Uh, function as spies literally that's called the council of night in the law so again plato's the father of the deep state so you're just again showing ignorance when people there ain't no such thing as conspiracies there ain't no what are you talking about if you never read the republic <laughs> you never read machiavelli well, there are no conspiracies art of war this is a book dummies it's a real book do you see this book? No, uh, you talk. He, he's so dumb. He thought it was. He thought all the war was written by his, his son too. It ain't Machiavelli. <laughs> 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 we got him. 
There's another Art of War written by Machiavelli. And in book six, he tells you all about conspiracies. Oh, so again, the very book that is the founding of modern warfare. This is the treatise that is the basis for the transition out of medieval warfare into modern warfare. It has an giant chapter about deception and conspiracies and espionage and warfare. Oh, but there aren't conspiracies. I don't like to talk about conspiracies because it gives me the... Uh, it gives the impression that I'm very sophisticated and centrist and, and I'm beyond all of this. No, it actually just demonstrates that you're a suit. Or you're a hyper expert in one area and you don't know, you don't have general knowledge. So as you can see, what are the what's the legacy and influence of Immanuel Kant's essay on world government? Oh, liberal internationalism of Woodrow Wilson, the 14 points of the United Nations. Yeah, exactly. H.G. Wells said that the war to end all wars would, forgive, would give us this peace process. Oh, yes, yeah, thank you. So again, even Wikipedia could tell you that Immanuel Kant's principles of Enlightenment libertarianism are heavily influential in today's movement for world government. Now let's talk about this chapter in von Hayek that everyone ignores. Yeah, man, I don't want to be a serf. The road to serfdom, dude. <laughs> Libertarianism. Ugh. What is this chapter? What's this appendix nobody talks about, this last chapter? What does that say? The prospects of an international order. Oh. Oh. An international, that's kind of what Kant's talking about, isn't it? So you see what was at the time of the Enlightenment presented as a movement of freedom against throne and altar was actually just another type of international mercantile order. And when you read Quigley, Quigley makes it 100% clear as well that this was actually fostered by banking and corporate elites cartels and the bank fiat power, the banking power, the fiat banking power, the usury power, was what was mainly concerned with instantiating and pushing classical liberalism. It's the first two or 300 pages of Tragedy and Hope. I've lectured through the whole thing for you. And by the way, Quigley says the same thing in Anglo-American Establishment where he says that the liberal international order was fostered by a separate sector of society, the corporate slash money power. And so the pushing for democratic rights across the world has its origins in the British imperial liberal order. So this wasn't something that the CIA cooked up in the Cold War. Oh, let's push human rights. Let's use uh, human rights as a cloak for interventionism. No, this goes back to the British strategy. Uh, I think it's Lord Curtis wrote a book called the, the uh, uh, what was it called? The Commonwealth of God. And it's very similar to what you get in Wilson's Wilsonian 14 points, what we just read here. It's the same thing because it's the same model. Kant's principles were present in the American liberal international order of Woodrow Wilson. Why was Woodrow Wilson pushing that? Well, everything in Quigley and Sutton's books tells us because he was being pushed and handled by Colonel Edwin Mandel House working for the Milner Fabian Circles. So this is a 100% atheistic order. Just as atheistic in its presuppositions as the Marxist socialist dialectic of which they are the other half. And this is what's so hard for people to, they cannot get to wrap their minds around this. Especially the diehard libertarians. Now, 
after a little while, most people come around to see what we're saying. I mean, I, basically everybody that I meet in churches and in my audience, they're former people of this persuasion. And by the way, I don't care that you think that Von Hayek is not the true libertarian. So this is the no true Scotsman, right? The no true Marxist fallacy, the no true libertarian fallacy. Oh, uh, he's not a true. Oh, so basically none of them are the true libertarians and we'll ne we've never actually had a true free market. Okay. It's exactly what your dialectical necessary opposites the Marxist socialists say. We've never had true socialism, you see. It's never been tried. And every Marxist socialist says the forces of capital intervene to wreck and destroy any attempt to have true communism, socialism. And then the libertarian says the forces of communism, socialism, collectivism intervene to subvert and destroy any possibility of true libertarian free market principles. I know it's never been tried. I know. But how, why is it that Marx was a libertarian? I'm curious to know this. What? How was Mar Marx? Was no, yes, he was. What's Marx's final stage? The withering away of the state. State's no longer necessary when we have an absolutely libertarian final stage. And when you read the high-level dialecticians, I'm talking about people who were seriously initiated into the deep, deep levels of Marxism, like Habermas. I think Habermas is pretty high up there in the uh, Illuminate Confirmed sphere. Because when I read Theory and Praxis of Habermas, I can tell he, he knows that it's more than the battle of international capital versus international socialism he understands that's a dialectic that's giving birth to the next phase i mean habermas is deep into this stuff i mean he's got books with pope benedict right i mean you don't have books of pope benedict unless you're high level in this geopolitical structure and by the way i think they're both phony balonies that's what i'm saying i'm saying they're both bad news i mean you don't why, why would Benedict be writing books with Habermas? It's just crazy. So, oh, my book, I, I, I'm going to have a book coming out with Jeff Stein McEffrey next week. Hope you, hope you all appreciate it. I hope you enjoy it. Yeah, I'm co-authoring a book with Jeff Stein McEffrey on uh, finding the middle ground between uh, mind control, SEX, slaves, and libertarian freedom. Right? I mean, it's just ridiculous, but... So, last few points here. This was a great article that popped up. Uh, this is an academic journal. I uh, never heard of it. American Affairs. I'm not familiar with it. However, um, River Page sounds like somebody from the like River Phoenix, or like one of the <laughs> one of the Phoenix family or something. I mean, you, you, this is mainline history, okay? This is what I don't understand. It's like, it's not, this isn't conspiracy stuff. This is mainline history that during the Cold War, right, the CIA clearly adopted liberal talking points, liberal positions, neoliberalism in economics. You know, people are like on Twitter, they don't even know what this is. This is economics of open society. Okay, Karl Popper, the open society and its enemies. And it's not accidental that George Soros named his institute the Open Society Institute. Because Popper's idea is any position that posits transcendence or transcendent values is an enemy to the open society. Because the open society is in the inheritance of the classical liberal purview and by the way classical liberalism is not just libertarianism it is that in terms of Locke, barclay hume kant however what what what's the next child that emerges out of this dialectical furnace of this time frame 
who is also part and parcel of the Platonic heritage. Who, who is it? Who, who comes out of this? Before Karl Marx, well, there was a secret revolution going on throughout Europe. One of these figures was named Buonarroti. You familiar with Buonarroti? These are the socialists. And Buonarroti and his teachings of socialism had a crucial influence on a couple of other people that you might have heard of named Adam Weishaupt and the Jacobins of the French Revolution who are the revolutionary dialectical opposition to the Girondins, the right-wing revolutionaries of the French Revolution. Now, who do you think America was influenced by? You might be tempted to say, oh, just the Girondins. No, actually, they were influenced by both. The reason that America has such a enlightenment, Freemasonic heritage is precisely because of this point, because it is an enlightenment propositional experiment and creation. As a nation, America is the product primarily of the Girondins, the right-wing quote-unquote revolutionaries, but there's also a good amount of influence from the Jacobins. If you read Thomas Jefferson when he talks about the necessity of bloody revolutions, if you look at the uh, satanic influences on uh, Benjamin Franklin, and yes, Benjamin Franklin was a participant in the satanic rites of the Hellfire Club on record. We can see then that there's also a, a straight up Illuminist influence. And, and by Illuminist, I mean the actual Bavarian, Weishaupt, Illuminate, Confirm, who are Enlightenment liberals. They're just Enlightenment liberals of a different flavor from the Locke, Barclay, and Hume liberals, you say. So you get a couple strands of enlightenment liberalism. Do you want right-wing revolutionary Garandin, Garandinism where you get private property, constitutional republics, and negative liberty? Or do you want left-wing revolution, which is Jacobinism, socialism, communism, straight-up guardian class, Plato's Republic? Which one do you want? You could argue that Garandin is a little more of like an Aristotelian approach. And you could argue that the Jacobin is a is what is called uh, Neoplatonic athe atheism. Literally, that's the academic literature's terminology for it. I'm not making these things up. This is not a conspiracy book. This is the Librarian of Congress, famous scholar J uh, James H. Billington, Fire in the Minds of Men, and this is a this is an apologetic. He believes in the revolution. Okay, he's not a conspiracy theorist. People that are dumb out there. People that don't know history these are mainline texts now what i really liked about this and i'm not going to read this whole uh, paper because it's pretty long but i'll i'll give you guys the link here it talks about well you might think that the oss and the cia were sort of like default quote right-wing institutions or something like this and I guess it depends on maybe the time frame or what specifically we're talking about. Because it's true that in the 1940s, you know, the early phase of the OSS, we wouldn't necessarily be having a full-on Skittles push. Sure. However, does that mean that the presuppositions of the ethos of the CIA and its approach to Americanism, that they were therefore, quote, right-wing and conservative? Well, this is what I hear in so many of the classic left critiques of the CIA. And I've read all, all, I mean, all of them, but I've read tons of these. I mean, I have a giant shelf over there of geopolitical texts, many of which are premised from a left critique of the CIA, many of which are critiqued from a more right critique. And some of them are uh, defenses of, the, of this establishment from members of the establishment, right? The Quigleys, the Rockefellers, the Brzezinski's. So, you know, I know these texts well. And when it comes to the classical kind of, uh, I guess we could say the American progressive critique, right? 
their critique is usually, oh, the CIA is this sort of um, right wing tool of, of money. But now, wait a minute. If we're talking about classical liberalism, then the CIA is a perfect example of classical liberalism. Because figures like William F. Buckley, who many right-wing critics have pointed out, Buckley seems to have been a figure uh, who interjects libertarianism into conservatism to really just steer all forms of conservative right-wing politics into libertarianism, which he did effectively, which, again, neutralized the older conservative critiques of American foreign policy, America first, all that kind of stuff. I'm not talking about Fuentes American first. I'm talking about the original American first. Right, so you get these libertarian figures presented as conservative, Buckley being the classic CIA example, who become the face of, quote, conservatism, and really is just moving conservatism into the next phase of liberalism. And so the, the reason this article is so great is that it talks about Gloria Steinem as a prime example, as well as all these other Skittles people. So check this out. I guess I can make a big screen because the dummies in the audience who actually can't read or won't read... So let me make it giant for you because I know it's really hard for you to go read an article and you'll never do it. But you're going to sit there and say, I don't know what I'm talking about, I'm sure. The CIA was consistent in its anti-communism, but it was not conservative. Did you see that? But wait a minute. How? I thought to be anti-communist meant that you're a rad, trad, right-winger. No. It means you're a classical liberal, a neoliberal. The CIA was consistent in its anti-communism, but it was not conservative. The feminist Gloria Steinem went so far as to characterize the CIA as a liberal, nonviolent, honorable organization. Steinem would know. She freely admitted to working with the CIA through its front organization known as the Independent Research Service. The CIA's Harry Lund encouraged her to become the face of the organization, sending her to lead a group which would disrupt the proceedings of the Marxist Youth Festival in Vienna. 1959, then in 1960. And this, of course, is the basis for when we point out that this is why the CIA was so involved in funding so many leftist cultural projects, including Playboy magazine, including abstract art, Jackson Pollock, Andy Warhol, all got CIA money because the CIA is not a, quote, right wing conservative institution. For example, I was watching a uh, classical sort of leftist progressive guy doing a multi-tiered uh, video analysis of the CIA. It was really good in terms of his history. And then he got to this one point where he's like, because the CIA has this history of being a right-wing organization. And I'm like, what is right-wing about any of this? What does that even mean? <laughs> right? What are you talking about? So in other words, so all forms of anti-communism are therefore right-wing. No, do you understand that liberalism is what was anti-communist the communists the soviets opposed liberalism can people not understand this is like history 101 this is a very basic fact and it's just really annoying to me one of the reasons that i get on one of these kicks and i want to have these kinds of debates is because i see the maga crowd the evangelical boomer crowd they share the yuri bezmanov clip and we got to watch the Yuri Bezma. It goes in cycles, right? So I, and we'll, 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 I'm sure we'll see it again soon, before the election especially. We're going to get the Yuri Bezmanov clip cycled around. Now, have you watched the full interviews with Yuri Bezmanov? Because I have. And what does he go on to talk about? He says that beyond the Iron Curtain, the Skittles are oppressed and Skittles needs to be freed up. Interest. So the CIA is not a right-wing conservative institution. Exactly. And I'm just so tired. I've, cause I've, I've seen the Yuri Bezmanov clip shared for 20 years in alternative media. And, on the, it's, and it's, nobody ever knows what they're talking about. 
And let's say let's take another example of this. Jordan Peterson's critique of postmodernism and Marxism socialism. There are some overlaps between Marxism socialism and postmodernism. It's true. For example, the Frankfurt School theorists, they did have what we can call a Nietzschean or postmodern turn. However, the Soviets were not into postmodernism. Stalin and the Soviets were not pushing postmodernism. Totally not true. Just like, what? Literally, the CIA recruited and worked with Derrida and re deconstructionists. French critical theory and the Frankfurt School 100% clear as day, easy to verify in mainline geopolitical foreign policy journals and histories. The CIA worked with the Frankfurt School. The CIA recruits Derrida and French critical theorists. Not Stalin. <laughs> not, not the NKVD. They had different philosophical positions and ideologies that they wanted to defend. Now, I said this today, and we always get the same people who go, yeah, but this Cold War was a dialectic. I know that. I am the one who has pushed that the most. <laughs> okay? Don't preach to me what I preach. I've been lecturing through Quigley for eight years. I've been lecturing through Sutton's books. I'm the one that says it's a dialectic. However, this is an important point that people miss. The dialectic has to be real opposition. So to whatever degree Stalin was or was not playing his role, it doesn't ultimately matter. And by the way, for those who think that I'm just saying this and talking out of my butt, no, there's actually a really good article by Kerry Bolton. And don't tell, I'm not advocating everything Kerry Bolton says because I cite his article. How Stalin foiled the New World Order. And of course it doesn't come up. Origins of the Cold War. How Stalin foiled the New World Order. So you should go read this paper. Because it makes a great point. And don't give me some dumb low IQ argument that this means that I'm saying Stalin's a good guy. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just simply saying. Simply saying that... The dialectic needs to be a real conflict, at least at the ground level or at the level of the nations. To what degree there's a super international agreement or behind the door agreements or that it's being preempted and played or promoted on purpose. Yeah, I think that there's there's truth to that. Quigley says that. Uh, I've got five books over there from historians on my shelf about how the British Empire wanted and provoked and, and at least helped tiny mustache man do what he did. So I'm very I'm well aware of this thesis. And I'm not saying that this means that everything is fake. Do you understand? It's a mix of both. For the dialectic to really progress, for those that have dialectical philosophical assumptions, and, and Marxism is a kind of secret society religion of dialectics literally for it to work you have you got to have a real conflict okay so stalin not accepting the marshall plan aid is the beginning of the cold war now there were secret deals about the gorky auto park being built by ford i know all that well aware of all of it so exactly how this all went down i don't know i don't i can't read stalin's mind but I do know one, with 100% certitude that Stalin did not advocate postmodernism, abstract art, Western liberalism, Skittles, or any of that. That's just categorically 100% silly and false. And his enemies, at least to some degree, were members of the Frankfurt School and Trotskyites, et cetera, et cetera, right? The Frankfurt School did not like Stalin. The Trotskyites obviously didn't like Stalin, at least as far as we know, because Trotsky has 
is assassinated by Stalin's agent. And if you read the Rakovsky interrogation, this actually makes perfect sense. Again, whether that's, I don't, I don't know if that's 100% authentic. By the way, I actually found somebody mailed me um, old NKVD interrogations. And Rakovsky is in there as well as some of them. Now, the famous Rakovsky interrogation is not in this text, but there are Rakovsky interrogation texts in there. So we know Rakovsky was interrogated for a fact by the NKVD. Uh, whether the infamous interrogation concerning the conspiratorial dialectics is authentic is up for debate. However, again, it, to me, it reads like it reads like what a real initiated high level Marxist would say. I think it's authentic in my opinion. Because it, if you read somebody like Habermas in theory and practice, you can tell when you're, when you're reading a high level, like this, this kind of, this is a guy who knows this at a big scale. Like he's not like in the Rakovsky interrogation, which we did a whole lecture on this. Gabriel, his interrogator is a much lower level Marxist. He doesn't get it. And a big part of that interrogation is Rakovsky saying why Stalin is bourgeoisie and not really a member of the revolution. Right. The no true Marxist fallacy. <laughs> so even the Marxists use the no true Marxist fallacy against all the other Marxists. That's why they all kill each other, right? Because they're like, oh, you're not the true Marxist. Anyway. So let's get back to... So this is a great essay just showing that there might be more to... So, again, I reject the idea that we we should over-conspiracyize or cons conspiratorialize everything in the Cold War. All right? You can go too far with this. Plus, it makes it too easy, right? It's like, oh, well, it's, uh, everything was fake in the Cold War. Not everything was fake. I mean, my uncle was flying reconnaissance spying missions over the Soviet Union out of Turkey during the Cold War. I mean, it wasn't fake. <laughs> he really did that. He intercepted the ICBM transmission, so that's not fake. So it's more complex than just saying, oh, it was all fake and everything was coordinated. I mean, there, there really is. I mean, Stalin is taking actions to kick off the Cold War. Now, whether that's what the elite originally ultimately wanted, I think so. But it doesn't mean that everything has to play out like... You know, like David Rockefeller's over here on his red phone and he like he calls to Stalin and tells Stalin what to do that day. And then David Rockefeller makes the call to, you know, Mao and tells Mao what to do that day. And then David Rockefeller calls up the, you know, Bush Sr. and tells him what to do. That. I mean, it's, it's not like that. So these are uh, people who, you know, are good researchers and they're good historians even if i don't agree with all their views or whatever that i think give us an insight into the complexity of this and yet we do have a good we have a do we do have a good co coherent account of the data that's out there from power elite figures like quigley right who again back up a lot of this and you'll notice that uh bolton in that pay essay he actually cites quigley to part of to sort of demonstrate this by the way the Wim Hof book says the same thing, right? He actually has the declassified uh, OSS CIA documents that that note that this is the beginning of the Cold War. Another thing that occurred at this time was the CIA exaggerated a lot of things too about Soviet capabilities to ramp this up, you see. But again, it was a great admission in this paper by... river page that you know, the, the the cia is not in fact this right-wing organization it never was and part of the reason that this paper that this person wrote this was about the fact that people are making a big deal about how the cia is now openly a bunch of got a bunch of woke stuff oh no the cia is recruiting skittles and they're woke well they were pushing the 60s sexual revolution. So what, what, why do you, why is that weird to you? <laughs> what are you, what are you talking about? By the way, 
This is another important point because I'm going to play one brief. Well, we, maybe we should just go to the debates. I don't know. I might want to play a little bit of this clip, but do people forgotten the Jaffe memo? I mean, what's the Jaffe memo point out? Now, Matt Walsh shared this. Of course, I shared this years ago, way before Matt Walsh shared it. He shares it in 22. I shared this 10 years ago. And what does it say? Well, it points out that in 1960, so this is a memorandum sent to uh, Bernard Berelson by Frederick Jaffe, the Center for Family Planning Program Development, part of the uh, Planned Parenthood World Population. The subject is activities relevant to the study of the population policy for the United States. And this is ultimately uh, coming from Rockefeller Foundation, if you know the background to this. And the memo says that these are the pro proposed measures for reducing fertility by university selectivity in terms of impact in the United States. Universal impact, the social constraints on the left, you'll notice they are to reduce, restructure the family, pushing the promotion of marriage and the avoidance of marriage. Now, this is going to be relevant for all of the red pill stuff because how many of the red pill people tell you there's no, the, the, there aren't conspiracies? And by the way, the Daily Wire, Normie, Tradcon people said there's no conspiracies. Well, now, wait a minute. This is a 1969 Planned Parenthood memo advocating for a societal level conspiracy, according to Matt Walsh from the Daily Wire, rehearsing and rehashing stuff that I said 10, 15 years ago. I'm not saying, oh, he, you're saying he got that from you. No, I'm saying that we were saying this stuff forever. This is old school stuff. And I'm glad he's talking about it. But the trad con sphere will demonize you and say you're a bad person if you talk about conspiracies. Even though they're basically talking about conspiracies right here. But it's only when they're allowed to talk about it, when it's amenable to a mass audience, then you can talk about conspiracies. But until it's acceptable in the mainstream to talk about conspiracies, I'm a bad person because I talked about it 10 years ahead of him, you see. And this is just, I mean, has not, have people not figured out that this is how like the normal, the normie trad con sphere works? And it's the same with, people like Jordan Peterson, who for many, many years said that he doesn't do conspiracies. He's above and beyond talking about conspiracies because it's sophisticated and all this stuff. And the people that go on his podcast with him in his sphere, including the Orthodox people, implying that it's bad to talk about conspiracies and that's not true and it doesn't happen. Oh, but I was right this whole time. Oh, but you're still bad uh, because uh, you were mean. Okay. Yeah. So, so it's not actually that I was bad because I was saying conspiracy stuff. Now it's a new thing that I'm bad because I'm mean. But you see, the thing about saying that somebody's bad because they're mean is that it's subjective. It's really subjective. Like, what exactly was mean? So, because I was in an informal blood sport setting that wasn't a formal debate. And somebody, somebody says, my wife is a witch and I respond to them and call them an idiot or something like that. That makes me a bad person. Would you not respond the same way if they came after your family or your wife or whatever? So what you start to notice is that there's this sphere of people who will only go where it's safe to go. Or what Sam Tripoli accurately called, he calls them uh, dangerously safe, Right. And that's really what the whole intellectual dark web and its whole sphere was built on was giving the appearance of actually exposing things and actually asking the deep, impossible, hard questions. But then when other people are pointed out as, hey, wasn't Jay Dyer saying this? Wasn't Lord Voldemort saying this? Oh, but they're bad people, you see. And then we get the virtuous victimhood, dark triad uh, signaling status going on by these people. But you can see, uh, this is if you've been in my audience, you know we've talked about this for at least 10 years. Anyway, the document goes on to say that, this is from 1968, by the way. 
or excuse me, 67. And it notes that everything would be done, including Skittles, including a sexual revolution from the top down by the establishment, including the possibility of fertility controls in the agents or in the water supply as a fertility agents in the water supply controlling fertility. Uh, heavy taxation to discourage marriage, reducing children, uh, promoting welfare, literally everything bad. Even to getting to the point of eventually compulsory uh, abortions for out of lock, out of wedlock marriages or uh, pregnancy, excuse me, uh, on and on and on. This is all real. Okay. Not a conspiracy text. And I'm just tired of virtue signaling people in the alternative media sphere saying I'm a bad person because I was talking about this 10 years ago and now they talk about it because it's safe to talk about it. And what's the source of this? Well, again, the source of this is what I'm saying, which is that classical liberalism is allowable. It's the circle of discourse that you're allowed to have. You can have it's, it's, too, it's the yin and the yang of the magic circle of what you're allowed to talk about. So you can talk about the classical liberal principles of Locke, Barclay, and Hume. Or you can talk about the its offspring, the other type of, quote, classical liberalism of Marxism, socialism. That's the two positions of the dialectical circle that you're allowed to talk about in today's modern public discourse. You are not allowed to go outside of that, Period. You are not allowed on podcasts if you are outside of that. You will not be invited on. Even if you were right about everything you said, you are not amenable to the predefined circle of the classical liberal dialectic. And yet, the very people in the tradcon sphere in the red pill sphere, in the classical liberal sphere, will have this pointed out to them. They'll eventually share it and admit that the system from the top down pushed the 60s cultural revolution, which Dave McGowan said 20 years ago. But you're still bad as a conspiracy theorist. Do you see how frustrating this is and how ridiculous this is? And for a lot of the people who are in that sphere, See, a lot of the people don't know the background stuff. Like, they don't know what goes on in the background, what people do in the background, and they think that you're that I'm mean and all this kind of stuff. You have no idea what people do in the background and what a lot of these people do. How manipulative and deceptive and just complete pieces of junk they are, and how fake a lot of this stuff is. How fake a lot of these media people are. And you can probably figure out who I'm talking about. I'm talking mainly right here. I'm talking about the public Catholic moral sphere of people who exemplify the dark triad traits of virtuous victimhood status, which is why I'm so happy that 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 I watched Rolo covering this paper because he's absolutely spot on when it comes to the normie tradcon sphere and how they operate. He's absolutely right. So I open it up. I welcome anyone who would like to come on and we'll discuss whatever you want to talk about. You can make your case for why I'm wrong about classical liberalism, why libertarianism is the true path, why there are no geopolitical conspiracies. I was wrong to talk about all this stuff. No, actually, it was not promoted from the top down, even though I said that for 20 years or so. Uh, no, no, no. You see, it was all... Uh, it's like... They're learning stuff at a lightning speed that we were saying 20 years ago. And it, I'm, we're still bad, even though we're right. That's the crazy part about all this. You would think that you would get, so, oh, I guess you were correct. So Jordan Peterson has RFK Jr. on, basically talking about all the, quote, conspiratorial stuff. YouTube pulls down that live stream. Okay, so are we going to admit that there's a conspiracy now? I mean, hello. <laughs> like what? 
And by the way, I am uh, f- on my fourth course. I'm four courses into Jordan Peterson's personality lectures. So nobody will be able to say that, oh, you don't actually really know what he says. You have an actual, no, I'm, I'm about eight hours in. Okay. So, and that's eight hours out of like a hundred hours. Okay. I've got 15 pages of notes already. So no, I do understand what he's saying and I will be absolutely ready to do full on analysis pros and cons. This is not, is that, I don't, you're just a hater. You're just jealous. No, it's not. I'm not a hater and I'm not jealous. I've always said with all these people, there's pros and cons. And anytime I learn something, I'm happy to learn it from anybody. That's what philosophers do. Philosophers are interested in learning even from people they disagree with. That's the ideal we, stri- we strive for. But this is another point that I think people who don't know philosophy they're, they're not familiar with this, right? You, you should want to have your ideas challenged. That's why I always open it up for debate. I don't mind anyone coming on here and debating and challenging my ideas. I don't care. But it has to be an argument, right? An argument is not, you're dumb and you're a KGB sorcerer. That's not an argument. Two quote ways is not an argument. Yeah, but what about your position? That's not an argument. Those are fallacies. So I'm, ha- I'm, I'm looking forward to diving into Carl Jung, psychoanalogist, Carl Rogers, constructivism, the hero- heroic shamanic journey, right? Hero with a thousand faces. Well, I mean, it's all the, it, that's what all of this is, and I don't mind it. So I want to be very clear. People are like, oh, you're just jealous. You only critique. No, no, no. I actually disagree with classical liberalism. And maybe I know what I'm talking about because maybe I was a classical liberal at one point in my life and maybe I criticized it. Maybe I learned the history of it. I know it's presuppositions. But I also know enough about how media works, mass media and alternative media, to know that there's a defined circle with which you can operate and with which you can't operate. And can nobody figure out that if you're allowed on every huge, giant mainstream platform, it's because you're operating within the allowed classical liberal perspective. So do you want CIA libertarianism or do you want CIA Marxism? Those are your two options, basically. Let's put it that way. All right, it's open forum. If you have a disagreement, if you would like to offer a critique, if you would like to offer a position, if you would like to make any argument you want, you can have the floor. I will allow you to talk as long as you would like to make whatever points you want. And for those that are curious, I will be going through all 70, 80 Jordan Peterson lectures. I don't mean I'm going to make a video on every one of his lectures. I'm saying that I'm going to summarize from the notes, specifically the positions where I agree and the positions where I disagree. And so you can have the floor, say whatever you want, but make sure that they're arguments. An argument is a specific premise with backing up evidence, a syllogism, whatever, to a conclusion. But just make sure that it's an argument. We don't need to know that. I I will just go ahead and tell you I'm a KGB sorcerer. How's that? So you can have that. I'll grant that to you. But today's topics, remember, are libertarianism and communism, metaphysics and God. So please no rappers. Please no slam poetry. That's not today's topics. Did you want to say something... Headless Giant. Thank you, Jay. I gotta say, I'm a big admirer of your work, and I agree with you on most, if not all, of your political takes. Fantastic job. I think you're doing a great job. You're looking out for a lot of the fallacies that a lot of people miss through their biases, but I gotta disagree with you on the God point. Okay. I'm I'm looking at it from more of a a conscious energy field perspective so like the the words we use make up a conscious energy field the lexicon what you're allowed to say what you're not allowed to say how you're allowed to phrase things how you're not allowed to phrase things that makes up our perception of god right so god would be this personification of a field of influence or a circle of influence right so during the pre-christian eras you would have multiple gods making up several different um 
circles of influence, right? So you've got the uh, Titans, you've got the uh, the Olympians, and what those were representing was ways of human endeavor as they cross over with nature. So it's like a, uh, a note card basis, right? And you find the same pattern occurring all over the world. You find it in India, you find it in Greece, you find it in the Germanic lands. And the reason why they were bringing this kind of knowledge with them is because it was less influenced by a central authority. And when you see things like the theogony, that's them attempting to bring it all together into a single authority. If you look back at uh, what the Old Testament is talking about, they talk about the Elohim. And it would be childish to assume that they're talking about the Trinity back then. That is uh, ad hoc, post proctor hoc or whatever that fallacy is called. You're putting the the cart before the horse. What they're talking about is polytheism. That's what they're talking about. Polytheism is the for monotheism. This is this is why I like to call it money theism, because if you've noticed back then, they would put the gods on all of the coins. And they wanted to have a single coin, a single point of control, a single control surface for all of the land. So that's why they needed monotheism. This is why a large degree of monotheism came out of Egypt into the Levant, took over that region. And this is why we have monotheism as the dominant force today. It's a way of controlling money. It's a way of controlling minds, right? When you have polytheism, a polycentric system, different areas are going to have different interactions with nature, different interactions with their personification of this infinite, which would be this conscious energy as it comes down to earth and manifests and as we witness it. So as we're witnessing the Uh, effects of nature on on mankind, the effects of nature on the environment, the effects of the patterns that we find in nature, what we're going to see there is the emergence of polytheism as these things take up a certain harmonic resonance within our lives. So I would like to just to wrap up my argument. I would say that monotheism is a way of creating an artificial means of controlling massive populations. And um, you don't have to be a polytheist. You don't have to believe in my gods. I'm just telling you that's that's what it is. It's a centralization of mental authority. I don't think mind control is a new phenomenon. I don't think it was pioneered by the military. I believe it is a very, very, very old concept that a lot of people figured out thousands of years ago. And that's why we have monotheism today. Thank you, Jay. Yeah, so I just have a couple of questions. Um, you made a few statements there that were pretty pretty heavy, pretty grandiose claims. And I'm not saying that you're wrong because you made the claims, but I'd like to know how we know that what you're saying is the case or that you demonstrate that that is the case. For example, you said, just a, I'll pick a couple here because you said a lot of things, but you said God is a field of influence personified. And then you said something later about infinite consciousness coming down to us through harmonic resonance. I, I, don't, I don't know what that's supposed to mean. But then you said monotheism is uh, basically just mind control. So how do we know and what does it mean exactly that God is a field of influence personified? What is, how do we know that? What does that mean? All right. Well, I'll, I'll see if I can explain it a little bit better. So uh, if you're a monotheist, you believe in uh, one entity or one creator force over the entire planet, over the entire universe, right? If you're a polytheist, you believe that there are several different forces over several different aspects of the natural world, and those have their own type of personality or expression that can be viewed as patterns. Right. Right. So how do we know that, one, God is the field of influence personified, and why should we think that? What are the arguments for that to be the case? Well, we would be expressing that in our language, right? So as we're witnessing these patterns, as we're experiencing the, um, the connection with the divine, we would be making up words behind it. But it would be beyond words that, w- that which we are experiencing. Like right. my experience now would be beyond the words that I'm using to relate it to you. So we would have to come up with a word for the thing, even though it's beyond the thing. Well, I hear you restating the position that you have, but I'm trying to ask you, like, how do we know that that is the case? 
What's the argument uh, of proof for that? I would say that um, my closest estimation of how we know is just by, um, well, I, I could say experience. You know, you would have to, you would have to have. Wait, whose experience? Your experience? My experience? Yes. Wh- whose? Yes. Your experience, my experience, everybody's experience. There's okay, no well, so what if, uh, what if I say my experience is different? That's fine. Yeah, that would be your sphere of influence would be different. Your experience would be a different, and this is why it's your personification. Okay, so what's the commonality that's personified there between two conflicting experiences? I think it could be explored through discourse, through rhetoric. You could explore it and find if there are similarities with your experience. Yeah, but how does that tell? A lot of these things actually do have a lot of crossover between a lot of these individuals, and that's when people start to go, huh? Maybe there is something beyond just this material plane. Okay, but how do we know that that's, quote, God? And how do we know that that's the case? Because there's a lot of commonalities. Maybe it's just commonalities of error. Right. The commonalities of error are experienced, too. I wouldn't, I wouldn't rule that out. But I think pursuing something higher than one's own self and one's own self-interests is something that is within our field of experience. And finding the patterns, again would be a way that we could relate that to one another. Yeah, but it seems like a lot of question begging because, again, I'm asking, how do we know that the commonalities are the God thing that you're talking about and that we ought to, quote, follow that? And what does it even mean to follow that if basically what we're what we're talking about is relativized? And if what we're talking about is relativized, then it's basically differing per individual. So how do we know that if it's differing per individual, even if there are commonalities, that that matches up to some being beyond the here and the now? Well, I don't, I don't think that it would ever uh, fully match up. You know, we've got Baptists. Well, how do we know it matches Catholics, up to anything at all? We've got Eastern Orthodox. We've got all sorts of different t- ty- types of Christianity that are based upon the experiences these people have reading this book. Okay, so it's, you're basically giving like a William James kind of account. And I'm just asking for how do we know that we ought to follow that because there's commonalities. See, the how we know what we ought to follow, that's an interesting question. Because that's what I'm asking. Point, yeah, it's the one I've asked point, twice. Uh, people could say, well, you know, I feel attracted to children. So then we can, we can all assume that that's our God. The unfortunate part of this, though, is that you have to be able to look outside of your own interests to actually be able to follow this path. So it's the looking outside of one, one's own interests and one's own uh, desires okay. that would lead so, a person to okay. feeling You keep restating what your position is, which is ad right. hoc, and I'm asking for the reason why we should believe this position. Well, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't give you a, uh, a reason... Okay, then there's that, not an uh, argument against... That you the, couldn't find yourself, because what we're talking okay, so about... Then there's the not, so then it's relative... Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so then I there is no ar- so you have no argument because it's, human experience. So it's relative and there's no actual argument because argumentation presupposes non-relative objective logic, right? Well, I could give you um, a better example. For example, numbers don't actually have um, a concrete meaning other than what we've attributed to them, but if we choose to go outside of the boundaries that we've established through logic, we end up destroying the number system. So again, everything that you've posited is ad hoc and it's self-admittedly subjective. And so you've surrendered the possibility of argumentation. I don't know if that, um, using uh, good analogies would be a, uh, a surrender. Right. So I'm, I'm using the analogy as a what means you've, of communicating. What you've already admitted. As, as a means of winning yeah. an argument that I view as necessarily unwinnable. I can, I can show you my right. point of so view. So in other words. That kind of makes sense. Right. So you didn't have an argument against a position. You had an explanation of a conspiracy theory from history, which is admittedly ad hoc and arbitrary, right? Well, it's not because we could see in history all of the different coins from all of these different areas that all have different gods and all represent different belief systems. And then we yeah, but that's, see that's another fallacy. So that's another fallacy. The centralization of authority through the uh, motion of empires okay. to centralize that authority greater and greater until we reach a point where everybody must be one religion 
because we say so, and this is your money, this is your money theism. Right, but none of that matters if you're not going to give an argument for why your position is true. Well, I think um, that is uh, separate from my position on the existence of other gods. I'm saying this is what happened in history. Okay, well, something to think about. We're going to have to move on, though. I appreciate that. All right. Boas Rickle. Are you there? Just hit on mute, dude. Hello? Yes, sir. What's up? Uh, yeah. So uh, when it comes to libertarianism and communism, uh, I wanted, I'm not, I'm not a libertarian. I actually come more from the uh, new right perspective and I, wanted to propose an argument in favor of libertarianism just to see what would be your response to it. Um, it's more of a pragmatic argument on the issue. So I don't know if that fits within the description of what you'd be interested in when it comes to talking about libertarianism. Or are you more about like a more philosophical issue of, uh, about libertarianism and its viability? Well, I mean, I, I, a pragmatic argument could have import, but... I mean, it's only going to go so far, so you can you can make whatever point you want. All right, so the way that I, I would present the argument is basically by stating first that, uh, so it seems to me that one of the primary uh, tools with, with which the uh, system is looking to reorganize civil society is through the state. So we can see this with the uh, intervention of the state uh, towards the, the dissolution of... Uh, it's organic structures like ethnic homogeneity or the family. So if we do agree that the state is one of the primary me tools which with it pursues its goal of the restructuration of society uh, and social existence, then why would it not be reasonable to say that uh, disarming the oligarchy would first and foremost come by reducing the power of the state over civil society as much as possible? I think that... Practically or pragmatically, that's an interesting point. Yeah, I think you could. Uh, I think you could argue that maybe that's a good strategy, but it still is not diagnosing what the real problems are in society. And the reason it doesn't is that the problem in society is not primarily quote the state because it's a corporate run state, right? So if it's a corporate state, then it's the private entities that own the state which are now the problem. And the state, quote unquote, is really just another manifestation of a private power. It's basically a giant corporation, you could say, which has the ability to, you know, shoot you and kill you if you don't agree with it, or if you don't do what it says, or if you don't pay your taxes, blah, blah, blah. So it's basically, it's, it's just, it's all differences in name, but an actual power manifestation is the same. So I would say strategically, yeah, that's probably a good, a good, uh, a good way to approach the question, but to naively think as many libertarians and classical liberals do that we can avoid real politic and avoid conspiracies because the world will function on the basis of some sort of absolutized universal ethic of NAP or some sort of nonsense like this is just completely to, to ignore history to completely to ignore the fact like let's take Kant for example Kant thinks that I'm going from memory here but something like if uh if we have free market economics, we won't have war anymore because everybody will just be incentivized to, uh, you know, gain profit and have a business. I mean, this is just so naive about human nature and how humans operate. And another thing that some of these uh, classical liberals miss is the doctrine of the fall. So they treat the world. This is one of the key criticisms I would have of, of Dr. Peterson after... Uh, going through just eight hours of his stuff so far, I can already tell that a lot of his analysis of the world as it is, this structure of chaos and order in a dialectic that's necessary to produce who we are, it's absolutizing and taking the fallen state of the world as if that's uh, all there is. And so if we don't take into account the fall, we're going to come up with these kind of absurd, absolutized views like Kant and the classical liberals do, which is premised on, you know, tabula rasa. Well, what if tabula rasa is not true? Okay, well, then all, all, if the anthropology of the Enlightenment is false, then the classical liberal solutions will never work, and they only produce more of the dialectical problems. All right, yeah. I think I, think I, I understand where you're coming from 
with regards. So basically, your problem is not with regards to the possibility of a libertarian strategy. It's more with regard to the foundations of, of libertarianism, maybe a little bit like after the revolution, so to speak. How will we be able to reorganize society? And is it possible to overcome corporate power just by reducing the power of the state? Is, is that an appropriate, like, well, I mean, I th I don't think men's problem, man's problem is not primarily like a socio political problem, right? Another pro another thing the Enlightenment does is that it locates man's problem as something uh, exterior and systemic. So whether it's the Garandans or the Jacobins, the idea is that if we just had a better social order, a more fair, just social order, something exterior to man then man would have a better, happier life. And you'll notice that, you know, when you look at what Declaration of Independence was basically comes from Locke. It's Lockean phrases of life, liberty, the pursuit of property, the pursuit of happiness or whatever. Those are all material oriented. They're all uh, immanentized. Like the telos, the purpose is all immanentized. And so it's divorced from all notions of the transcendent, all notions of God, all notions of theology. Thus, everything is necessarily immanentized. So in the same way, we're not going to solve our problems by some sort of right-wing revolution or something like that, which is all, is, in my view, pie in the sky. I mean, it's very possible that the whole uh, system as it is could collapse, and that might be a good thing down the road. Um, but I don't know about any kind of, quote, revolution. I don't, I don't, I don't know about that. I don't think that's, that doesn't make any sense to me. But um, Well, I, I would just propose the idea that like if we were to take away the power of the oligarchy through the state then eventually what would happen naturally is that with free association you would see that people who are more um, i guess conservative would probably be able to survive over the long term on on an independent basis whereas the forces that would be more uh, associated with the generacy require state intervention to be funded so that they can continue to pursue their degenerate aims. Yeah. Without, so in that case, they would just disappear on their own, like die off or whatever. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to say because I, I just, I don't, I don't follow politics really, like day to day politics enough to really even. I'm not sure how effective it even is. Like, is it really even realistic anymore after? You know, the last few years to think that we can capture the political levers of power i mean i just don't even know i don't know maybe maybe it is maybe somebody can still get bays people elected I, I don't know it just seems to me yeah. like maybe we can finally elect ron paul <laughs> <laughs> well we just audit the fed well if we audit the fed well i mean maybe okay well, so yeah. i mean again these are all just kind of like exterior solutions right and there are a lot of exterior problems sure i mean yeah, the Federal Reserve sucks, but it's just so, it's all kind of wrong-headed, like, well, if we could just do this political thing, right, or this, uh, it, it's, this is the thing with the Enlightenment, all of the Enlightenment stuff is all like, man's problem is this structure in society, it's this group over here, it's this thing over here, it's, it's the ty tyranny, but wait a minute, what if man's problem is the fall in himself, you see? Right. You know what I mean? Like, and I'm not saying that doesn't spill out into politics. It was like, maybe we should flip it. It's, it's just all the same, like, bitching and whining about exterior structures that oppress. And it's like, well, so the libertarians are basically the same as the social justice warriors, just bitching and whining about exterior oppression. And maybe our problems are first and foremost interior that then should spill out exterior. That's what I'm trying to say. But All anyway, right, yeah, I think you have a good point. Video. You have a you have a good point there about the strategy there. Uh, Tim Tim Burkhard, what's up, dude? By the way, if you guys would hit like and share, you can also support the stream via the super chat function. So we are giving our critique of the blind spots in libertarian classical liberal philosophy, and that includes a critique of both Marxism and libertarianism so i've always had the same position my positions on this haven't really changed uh i think i tend to at least pragmatically line up with more libertarian people 
than I do the Marxist socialists. But that doesn't mean that uh, I'm a presuppositional enlightenment uh, liberal who thinks that we can have some kind of, I don't know, economic solution to man's problems. I mean, what if man's problems are, I mean, it's like the economic solution presupposes that man is a homo economicus. Big Pharma proposes that the solution to man's problems is chemical because they see man as a purely physical chemical being. So they just throw more chemicals at him. Well, what if, I mean, all of these models are based on a certain kind of anthropology and metaphysic, namely a materialist metaphysic, right? I mean, the anti-metaphysics of the Enlightenment is based on the presuppositions of materialism. It's just a different kind of materialism it's materialism with property rights, bro. It's materialism with don't tread on me, bro. Okay, but if everything's material process, then why should I not be a cunning, conniving Marxist who wants to screw you out of everything that you have for my own personal gain and power? There's no oughts in this view. Well, no, you ought not to uh, violate the non-aggression principle. Why? I mean, nature is full of the aggression principle. I'm pretty sure predators and prey right now are engaging in a battle of which the predator will win. So if man is a, another manifestation of nature, and if we're going to have libertarian, quote, natural rights and natural law, then by the law of the jungle, which is my natural right, I'm going to eat you. I'm going to Jeffrey Badonkadonk you. I'm going to eat your butt. And on a natural rights, natural law philosophy position, on what basis is that wrong? And don't just give me some bullshit of self-evident maxims and principles of the non-aggression principle. The non-aggression principle. Oh, you can't violate the NIP. Can't violate the NIP. Uh, I see lions violating the NIP, NIP all the time. And by the way, the dumb vegans are like, maybe we should put lions in jail. Literally. <laughs> Jim Bob had a debate with uh, uh, vegan gains and Jim Bob got vegan gains to say that bears, because they're aggressors and they're predators and uh, carnivores should be put in jail. <laughs> <laughs> we need bear jail, dude. Put the lions in jail. In, in the oppression of nature. Put the lions in jail. In the oppression of nature. This is so stupid. What's up, dude? Do you want to talk? Oh, wait. Tim, what's up, Tim? By the way, have you noticed how evolutionary psychology and evolutionary biology uh, are only useful insofar as they fit with the classical liberal story? So it's fine for it. Dr. Peterson can bring in evolutionary psychology and biology, except when it conflicts with uh, what's acceptable to a mainline classical liberal audience. Then you can't talk about that stuff. Go ahead. Hey, uh, hey, Jay. Uh, I, you were you were saying a lot of what I was going to say, but like liter libertarianism uses a materialistic frame. Yep, it's the wrong frame. Yep, and they are ideological first and foremost. Yep. Um, when I, I read uh, Social Needs in the Gulag Archipelago years ago, and I remember as I was reading it, I had like close libertarian friends, and I was reading, you know, what the Bolsheviks were saying, how they approach things, and I kept in my head putting the uh, li my libertarian friend in their shoes mm -hmm. and i wondered how many people i asked him this like how many people let, let's just say all you libertarians were in charge of everything and let's say it just wasn't going you know initially as well as you hoped it would how many people would have to die before you would start questioning your ideology and how many years would have to go by before you'd start saying well maybe this wasn't a good idea and he could he you know he he said, "No, it would just work." No, that, yeah, that's that's, that's when we get we get the no true libertarian fallacy, right? Right. Just like the no true Scotsman. Now we have the new, no true libertarian fallacy. But uh, yeah, that's a good thought experiment. Like, what at what point would the historical evidence uh, demonstrate that maybe this is just not a realistic system? Again, it's kind of like It's like uh, Brian Callen, for example, right? I don't, I don't know if he's, maybe he's a classical progressive liberal of some kind, but, you know, he'll say stuff like when he's debating on, uh, we had that de 
cordial sort of exchange debate on the Sam Tripoli show. And he's like, well, I just don't see that there could be geopolitical machinations at this level because it seems too complex and the world doesn't work that way. And, you know, it's it's you can't get away with these big conspiracies and this kind of stuff. And it's like those are people who say this and they say these kinds of positions, ironically, are never actually going to the data because the data of the top power elite confirms my position. But most people just spout these sort of generic ideas of, well, I don't think it could be that way. Well, uh, you know, the world's a complex place and it's hard to keep a secret. So it just doesn't seem to me like, so this is all psychological reporting that, uh, which is, you know, Matt Dillahunty does this, right? When you, when you pause an argument, Matt, Matt Dillahunty says, uh, I'm not convinced. Okay, so what? Your psychological reporting doesn't amount to any kind of argument or critique of, of my position. So in, in debate, psychological reports are irrelevant. They don't say anything. Then they're not relevant to... So, okay, thank you for telling us that you're not convinced, but that really has no relevance to whether what's being said is true or false, you see. So it's kind of like the the people in the libertarian world or in the normie tradcon world, they do the exact same thing. Never go to the data, never go to the books, never go to the actual texts that are out there, the white papers, the NGOs, think tanks, no, it's, well, it just doesn't seem convincing to me and it doesn't line up with what I think about how the world, okay, well, that's, that's fun, but where's the argument? Yeah. <coughs> Thanks, buddy. Yeah, great points. Uh, Tim, thank you for that comment. Let's move on. Next up is Curious Gazelle. What's up, Curious Gazelle? And uh, I've actually invited a lot of these people over the years to come do debates in the classical liberal sphere. For example, Dave Smith, uh, we had multiple tweets. I asked Dave, hey, come to a debate because he was doing debates about libertarianism. I mean, to date, we've only had uh, Adam Kokesh and Robert Taylor. Those are the only two libertarians that would even do a debate. So, but I mean, the floor is always open if there's any liberals or libertarians or Marxist socialists or whatever. Uh, Andrew was trying to get Vouch to do a debate. I guess Vouch, I don't know if he's a liberal or a socialist. I don't know what he is, but we tried Vouch. Um, I had a cordial exchange with Styx uh, several years ago. So we did a cordial debate on theism and then we had a, a discussion and then we had a cordial discussion on abrasion which touched on sort of libertarian stuff but so yeah, people don't de, de, people don't even think that debate is like an actual art anymore it's like they see it as just like a, oh that's a way to try to display will to power or something so it's, it's not even seen as having the value that it ought to have and again, we've covered this many times too. You know, debate presupposes a society with some degree of honor and virtue that people are seeking after truth, some degree of, uh, you know, education that people have. And we're just so, things are so bad that it's almost, it's almost not really possible to have classical formal debate anymore. It's getting that bad. Um, anyway, so did you want to say something, uh, Curious Gazelle? It's open for him. Curious Gazelle. You have to unmute, man. Are you there? Unmute. Well, it's open forum, so we got a, a room full of people here, 71 people listening. Any libertarians, any Marxist socialists, uh, the relationship of libertarianism to metaphysics, to God, to history, the Enlightenment. It's all open forum today. America, Americanism, the classical liberalism of Jordan Peterson classical liberalism of uh, any of the figures that are out there in the sphere of the Daily Wire or the whatever. If you have a critique, if you want to defend their position, if you want to tell me why I'm wrong, you can have the floor. For as long as you want, it's open forum. All you have to do is make arguments. I didn't say Dave Smith said Bausch is a libertarian. I said I offered Dave Smith to come have debates. I said that we tried to set a debate up with Vouch. I think Andrew's trying to do that. 
But I don't actually, I've never watched Valsh. I have no idea. I know he's like, looks like a soy man. But I, I have no idea what his positions are. But I know he gets like 5,000 live stream on his live streams. Oil Field Misfit. What's up, dude? Just hit unmute, bro. How's it going, fellas? What's up? How you doing? I'm doing real good. Just to chime in a little bit, I'm uh, I've always been kind of a little bit of a rebel, not not ever a leftist. My dad was hardcore uh, conservative, um, but I went through the system when I was younger. Had a really good upbringing. Um, never had that white privilege that missed me completely. Um, anyways, to chime in on you guys' conversation. I don't know if we're going to be able to handle this situation without, you know, uh, uh, the government wants us to see a civil war. We don't need to see that. It's not the people against the people. And anybody that's awake knows that it's it's a tyrannical government that is basically a world government trying to push their views down our throats. And I think that we're not going to be able to see this out, you know without some kind of a, a violent revolution. And I'm not pushing that. That's the last thing I want to see. I got kids. I got grandkids. And I'm thinking, you know, if we aren't close to the creator's judgment, then we're close to a, a big turn. And and I'm open. Everybody that, that I've heard talk tonight had, had some pretty good points on, on everything as far as that goes. And I just want to let you know, Jay, I love you, man. You do great work, uh, not only on your own, but on the Info Wars. Everything that you say and talk about, um, I listen, I follow, I, I send my kids all your stuff. It's amazing. Thanks, dude. I just wanted to, Appreciate that. I just wanted to throw that in there for uh, my tonight's chime before I grind out on this oil field tomorrow. Thanks, man. Uh, kind words. Appreciate that. Uh, Curious Gazelle, did you want to say anything or not? You're still muted. I guess not. Yeah, I'm, I'm really sorry. I was away from the uh, no from my phone. Um, so I joined pretty uh, recently. Uh, what has been going on uh, before that? How long has this space been going on for? As one of my friends, um, he sent me this space uh, via DM. Are you there? Hello? Sorry, you've managed to... Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, you just cut off for a second. So we've been going on for maybe Sorry. 50 minutes. Yeah, and... I'm, I'm incredibly impressed with you because you have to transcend politics a bit like uh, Owen Benjamin. And uh, you can criticize both the, uh, both the left and the right, uh, which most people, possibly people who are listening to you right now, cannot do. They're, they're just kind of stuck in this, oh, we've got to support one side, and one side's better than the other, and oh, yeah, we, we love RFK because he's talking against vaccines, but, you know, RFK. I think Owen Benjamin's right. When you listen to RFK, his throat chakra is fucked up. Like, he sounds like he's okay, got so, throat AIDS. Hold on. I'm so sorry to say. So today's topic is libertarianism communism and god so if you have a position on that then you're free to, to chat but that's the topics today no I, I don't really have a position on that because um, all right no problem I just, yeah. thank you so it's open forum but it's open forum in terms of the topics today guys so the topics are Debating libertarianism, communism, and its relationship to God and metaphysics. So if you have a comment on that, it is the topic listed at the top. And uh, next up is Nathan. What's up, Nathan? You came in next. You gotta unmute, dude. Nathan, you unmute if you want to talk. Yeah. Well, I, I uh, actually didn't uh, think I was doing this. I, I don't ever really even get on Twitter. Sorry. Um, uh, yeah, I, I kind of summed it up to uh, um, the 100-year light bulb uh, issue, you know, rather than getting into communism versus capitalism and, and all that. 
What you, um, the hundred year light bulb? What do you mean? Planned well, obsolescence. Like the, so in California, there was in a firehouse. There goes my. Hold on. Can you hear me? Okay. Yep. Okay. So you talking about planned obsolescence? What are you talking you about? You can make a light bulb last a hundred years. Yeah, planned obsolescence. Actual, so far as what I've heard. Um, there's, yeah, there's a documentary uh, on regulations it. Regulations that don't allow. Yeah, planned obsolescence. It's called the light bulb conspiracy. It's a great documentary. Yeah, good point. AC, what's up? Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Hey, how's it going, Jay? How you doing? Great. What's up, man? Oh, not much. I I got two questions for you. So, with with uh, I was reading Rush Dooney per your recommendation about this one of the many problem. And when he talks about libertarianism, he brings up the fact that uh, if they were looking for a new Burke, meaning somebody who could bring up some kind of Christian values after they atomized without actually being Christian. Do you think in Peterson they found this? Hmm. Possibly. Um, I mean, it's possible that the system sees him in that juncture. That's an, that's an interesting point because I would say that as I'm going, and again, I've only been, I'm only on the fourth lecture. So I'm eight lectures into Peterson. I would say that it's kind of a, a mix of Dostoevsky, Nietzsche, Carl Jung, Carl Rogers, uh, Neoplatonism, uh, and ideas of Christianity devoid of the actual metaphysical content. So interesting. Yeah, that's that seems to be his modus operandi. Now, this is uh, his 2014 lecture series of the uh, psychology of personality, which is like there's like a hundred lectures in there. So maybe he has a different position in 2023. I don't know, but going from uh, what his positions were at that time, yeah, it, it seems to be uh, it seems to be what I would call psychotheology. And for guys that are, that are interested, to, uh, we're going to be doing a live stream with Jimbo right after that. This, excuse me, at eight o'clock, we're going to do a critique of several of the figures in the public sphere uh, that are considered, I guess we could say, ideological rebels, right? So not necessarily intellectuals. We're going to do a critique of Tate. We're going to do a critique of Jordan Peterson and uh, Richard Dawkins. And uh, our thesis is that really all three of these are kind of atheistic at the root. Now, maybe they're open to moving in the direction of theism, but even the Tate statements about God, you know, he, when he, when he defines God, he basically says, God's kind of like your, uh, ideal of a self-help thing that you shoot for. So it's not, it's a concept that helps you strive in a self-help sense towards something better. It is not an actual being in his definition. That's like on the other end of the spectrum with what Schmemann says are too fundamentalized by Christianity then. R- remind what me what his, what his lies are. I don't so, remember what he says. One is to save the world through these big social movements and conform mm. Christianity to the world. And the other yes. is a reduction to the personal to help me with my problems. Yeah, exactly. Well said. Yeah, I didn't I didn't know that was his two two points. Yeah, I agree with that. Okay, and I got another question for you. Oh, by the way, I want to say, too, big... one other point I meant to say. We'll, we'll get into this, to this tonight with, uh, so, so Jim Bob did a good critique of uh, Tate and Peterson. And we're going to throw Dawkins in there as well. Uh, tonight's show is at 8, for those who are watching. That's an hour and a half from now, 8 p.m. Central. So it seems like psychotheology is how I would describe it. So it it works in the sense of popularity because Peterson's a clinical psychologist, so there's a lot of scientific information from clinical studies and whatnot that I guess he's published in. But then what happens is that he gives his talks and lectures on, on psychology that are full of kind of uh, philosophical referent, but then there's always the, well, I'm not actually saying that any of this exists. So it's sort of like these are archetypal mental structures that may not necessarily exist in any kind of objective metaphysical sense, but they're very real because our mind structures reality. So what I'm actually realizing as I get into the fourth lecture is that, and I don't know to what degree he's aware of Kant, but it actually seems very much like a Kantian position that 
when he's speaking of the archetypal structures, he's speaking of them as a mental uh, structuring machine or like a, like Bonson had a great description of it, like a, uh, the mind is like a, an ice cube tray that the incoming data is structured by the mind, but the uh, archetypal structures that structure are not metaphysically existing things, they're mental structuring things, you see. And the, the, the problem is that, okay, well, that might be interesting and that's cool for psychology, but God either exists or he doesn't in the sense of, right. you know, well, Christian theism. I, I could kind of tell you where he goes with this because I okay. was very sure. big in theater for like 10 years and I, oh, wow. I went down this road and I read a lot of his sources and I started having like these big religious experiences and trying to figure it out on my own. And like, he kind of like, he does believe that there is something real, but it's almost like it's, he's agnostic about it. And he just pawns all yeah. his metaphysics off to these people almost with like with a dialectical fate that they'll come together with some kind of truth and you'll find it just by being good. So when you, you start ha having all these problems trying to put together Jung with other thinkers and, and modern science, and, and you're all over the place trying to do that. You have to like build the whole, cosmos yourself yeah that's what i was going to say is the other so, thing the other thing i think because yeah. uh, that's a great point you made right there and it was actually in my notes for tonight's show is there seems to be the idea that because there's a, an anti-metaphysical stance of this enlightenment inheritance peterson seems to approach it like well all we really have is the data of science and so we're, we're basically just piecing together the system that is that is there in this gnostic sort of structure from the data and so it's sort of like we're we're doing it from the accounts of the great men right so we're going to read carl young we're going to read the uh, comparative religion we're going to read the perennialists we're going to read all these people and gather enough data tying it in with the science of clinical psychology and maybe we can grasp at piecing together what is the structure of the universe that seems to be his approach like that we'll we'll just kind of figure it out with enough data Yes, and I'll tell you where, where this is going, too, with Verveke, because it's almost like he has contrary uh, moral opinions with Verveke that I think even though he's not as scientifically advanced, he's better on, even though he's like sometimes scientifically wrong. But it kind of gets blown out of the water, and he has to synthesize with him because of this, because we have to keep going with the facts. So this is kind of like where you talk with Trent Horn, where he says you're doing natural theology in reverse, but you can't do it in reverse because it's not a reversible equation, right? Yes. Like if you don't presuppose right. God first, you yeah. start mixing these pieces of reality that you're getting with your knowledge and put, mixing them up with God, right? So the thinker that they're trying to fix this problem with this Kantian subject object divide is Henri Corbin. Yeah, Zizek use, uses him too because he's kind of got this Neoplatonic Islam and he docetizes Christ. So he's against Christ uh, as the incarnate God. Because he wants to keep everything kind of in, the, in this in this process, but he gets a little bit more overtly neoplatonic, and they use his idea of trans this idea of Verbeke's doing of trans transjectivity to kind of reconcile the different Jungian thinkers with modern science. Interesting. Okay, and his his name is Henri Corbon. Is that C O R B A N? I N, and it, and it's spelled Henry. We would say Henry Corbin. And uh, the text is what? What's his text? Oh, he's got that, that's you want. He has a, a bunch of texts that that's a whole giant rabbit hole, but like probably his two main ones would be uh, Alone with the Alone. And then it's not his main one, but the paper Cyclical Time and it's My Alien Gnosis is kind of like a core of his thing. And Tom Cheatham has written a book called All the World and Icon that kind of sums up his work and compares it to James Hellman and Carl Jung oh, nice. and how they relate. Now, this is good because I don't actually know what Verveke's positions are, so... I mean, none of these people will talk to me because I'm quote conspiratorial, which makes me a bad right. person. Even though I, even though I'm right about all of it, I'm still a bad person because I talked about it. But yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah no, I didn't. I didn't actually know about the the Corbin Verbarki Corbin Verbarki Verveki thing. There's one other thing you want to know about him because he was kind of like lean on where he was a traditionalist. Yeah. Even though he's very radical spiritually. He, was, uh -huh. he like was pretty conservative, but a lot of radical people are really using him. So like they think they can like use him in a moderate manner. Oh, interesting. But it's already being used for like kind of Greta Thunberg theology, you know, and the imaginal and David Bentley Hart's talking to talking about his imaginal that for is using all the people are agreeing to use to kind of bridge that subject object divide. And that's the same kind of people over at uh, 
Yale ecology and religion, and they're doing this kind of stuff for yeah. like you know green theology. Yeah, there's so always been there, there's, there's always been over, like, well. Uh, well, I could tell you. I mean, Prince yeah. Prince Charles is uh, into perennialism and utilizes it for uh, the green worldview. So, did you hear me? You're you're, you're cutting out. Can Can you hear me now? Go ahead. Yeah, so that that makes a lot of sense because it seems like that's almost where they all end up because they yep. disincarnate God. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. It's a, then, it, well, it, you, can't, you can't disincarnate God. They disincarnate their conception of God, and then disincarnate themselves and put us up into this flux philosophy. Well, yeah. Now, another thing I noticed. Another thing I noticed in Peterson's lecture is that he seems to think that when he dis, when he distinguishes something as being um, subjective versus objective, he says that objective truth is necessarily correlated with the Newtonian worldview and the idea that objects are just these sort of static objects which is not true so uh i mean it might be the case with a newtonian materialist that you would see objects as sort of dead matter and having no context but the idea that that there's only the choice between an inner uh subjective schema of uh, symbolic correspondences which is embedded or a choice between a newtonian um scientific objectivism which is dead matter i mean those are that's a false choice that's a false either or right and we could speak of something being objectively true that's not necessarily connected to a newtonian physics worldview that's just bizarre to me that he thinks that right yeah that, that makes but he is sense. actually but he is when he makes that point believe it or not he, he is actually hitting hitting on the point that we make as presuppositionalists that objects are uh theory dependent they're not theory neutral they're theory laden so he's actually inadvertently because he actually th there's multiple times where he'll get really close to transcendental arguments and presuppositionalism like in the in, yeah. in in the lectures he does this and in the uh matt dillahunty debate he did this he got really close to uh transcendental argument critique of dillahunty and then he backed off of it but he's correct in at least seeing that it doesn't make any sense for any experience of an object to be theory neutral. So I think that's what he's hinting at, or hit, that's what he's aiming for. Um, but he's kind of not getting like the metaphysical context of it, and that Christianity actually provides a Christian metaphysic. So he's still couched within post enlightenment thinkers. That's the problem here. There's there's never a reference to pr that I've seen so far outside of like ancient mythology like he, like he's talking about ancient shamanic initiations and he's saying well you know if you think about the shamanic worldview they saw all of nature as alive and so for them it's alive in a you know everything's part of the god picture for them and that's more accurate than the idea of the post enlightenment newtonian idea that objects are just these static uh, newtonian things with qualities so he's hitting on something correct, but he's not grasping that you need the Christian metaphysic to give this the context that you're looking for. For example, in the third lecture, and I won't keep rambling about this, but in the third lecture, he says, think about a human being's experience in the world like uh, a computer that has a bunch of levels to it. And he says that if you think about it, any piece of the computer in the components of the computer they all work together as a whole and he uses that as an analogy which is an analogy that we've used in presup quite often um and and i've used in a lot of argumentation as well so i'm not saying that he stole it from me i don't know what jordan peterson listens to although i did see years ago he did actually tweet out a transcendental argument implying that it was proving god from numbers which was my i think that might have actually come from me but um point being is that uh his structure of the human personality embedded within culture is and is he's makes an analogy to the embedding of the various parts to the whole relationships in a computer and that's correct and he's making the point that you can't really understand you know windows as an operating system without the hardware you can't understand the hardware without the keys and the keyboard and the you know base layer and all this kind of stuff and that's a, that's a great point for holism right that's called again all this stuff he's talking about is actually in philosophy but 
my sense is that, and I'm not trying to do, to downgrade him or, or diss him or anything like that, but my sense is that his uh, familiarity with philosophical ideas, terms, and topics, and writers is limited. So he's kind of edging on philosophy through Carl Jung, uh, Nietzsche, uh, Dostoevsky, uh, you know, maybe Joseph Campbell, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and you got to remember, too, that he spent a good amount of time when other people went off and kept going further into philosophy and, and psychological theory and further into the neuroscience. He kind of dug in at the level of uh, when Jakob Pangsepp was around and didn't go further, like where Verveke and McGilchrist is going. Mm. But he went and did clinical work yeah. and, you gotta, and was helping people. So this is kind of where Christianity is about more than just helping people that's that's nested in our, in our whole thing. Yeah. And where people go off and, and they get more theoretically advanced, he was kind of on the on the pragmatic basics of just what helps people. And it, yes, I think that's part of the re- that's part of his popularity is the pragmatic element of what he talks about. Yes, yeah. and with, with, with this with this holistic view, he's, he is he's doing it, but then he's, he he still has he gets kind of stuck in these parts. Yes. So, and it's already there in philosophy, but it is, it's just about this, it's, it kind of gets stuck in this amelioration. And then he brings in, brings it up to struggle, the meaning and struggle, but he doesn't have the grace element that we get into. With, with well, and that's, and that's because he doesn't have an account of the fall, right? So remember that the, you know, incarnation, at least historically and theologically is the remedy to the fall, right? Um, and if you don't have an analysis of the fall, then you're going to have a messed up theology of nature or analysis of nature in the Christian perspective, right? So this is yeah. why this is why, for example, he says chaos and order are just necessary fundamental components of, of, of the world, and they have to be the case. Now, for us, chaos or and he, sometimes he confuses this actually with potentia, right? So potentiality is not the same thing as chaos. Potentiality is a real uh, metaphysical idea that something could occur that was not before or that uh, objects or beings or persons have potentiality to be or to do something else than what they may or may not do, right? So that's different than, quote, chaos, which is this sort of anti-order principle or primordial chaos from which, you know, uh, Earth is uh, brought forth and ordered by God. And that's different. that's different from moral evil. But I, 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 there's a confusion in Peterson where moral evil, human potentiality or potentia proper, and uh, the primordial principle of chaos are all kind of identified as if they're the same things, and they're not, right? I mean, moral evil is not the equivalent of potentia, nor is it the equivalent of, quote, chaos. So why does he think that? Because in his system, there's not... A notion of the fall there's also thus not the notion of grace as you said and our and our conception of the fall is even more than just the fall right it starts with the cosmic fall yeah it's a it's a cosmic fall. thing right so it's yeah. not even anthropocentric so our focus on our humanity is actually like an icon of the divinity so yes it's not just about us it's even more holistic absolutely yeah well said by the way it's, it's more personal and more human absolutely yeah, by the way, great, great comments. Like, uh, I'm so happy to get a person that knows stuff I don't know. This is great. I, I got one, one more uh, sure. for you. Sure. Uh, I'm just, uh, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm losing it with my question. But, uh, oh, this is my question. Do you think some of why he confuses chaos with, with, with uh, potentia? and doesn't get the moral thing, even though he's trying to have the morals is because there's certain like pre-Socratic and far East suppositions in there. Absolutely. Yeah. In fact, as he, when he cashes this out, when he says that, uh, Osiris, uh, Osiris, Isis and Horus, right? Horus is the son between, uh, of order and chaos. So Osiris representing order patriarchy, right? And then Isis representing, uh, nature chaos formlessness danger threat that produces horus the sun and so to be a balanced person or a balanced individual is somebody who has uh i mean here's the danger of that you could read that in the union sense you've integrated your shade self right oh so i actually need the demonic right i mean it could lead yeah. to that right i'm not saying he's saying that but that's the problem and, and then when he so when he cashes that out he puts a list of the yin and the yang 
right? So the yen is the principle of uh, order, uh, logos, patriarchy, masculinity, um, structure, and then chaos is woman, night, uh, you know, moon, this kind of stuff. Potentiality. <laughs> Do you think that supp- those suppositions where you have to integrate and synthesize out of these dialectics leads to an inability to understand the way instead instead of integrating and syn- synthesizing with like with Taoism and other religions or with these philosophies, the way orthodoxy actually like put the sword of Christ to them and then transfigured them and baptized them or what you see with Father Damascene did with Christ the eternal Tao that, right. like, that they can't get this. Absolutely. They just mix. Yeah, I mean, my critique is that what's missing is a Christian metaphysic, right? And that mean meaning then ultimately the whole Christian ethos, right? I mean, that's what Peterson is missing here with this. So there's a lot of interesting ideas, and there's a lot of insights, and a lot of kind of stream of consciousness, uh, you know, tying in symbology that is that is uh, fascinating, and he is engaging to watch and listen to because he kind of throws in a lot of uh, art analysis and this kind of stuff, but what's missing is precisely what you're you're hinting at here, in my view, right? So my main critique is that that it's like, well, uh, how are we going to solve man's problems when we ultimately are refraining from any real metaphysical commitments and keeping an, a post enlightenment anti metaphysical stance? Because we're going to have to at some point grapple with metaphysics, namely God's existence. You see, right. And, and and if you can't do that, but you're you're dabbling in metaphysics, that's the other really critique. Yeah, that's the other critique. Is like he's constantly sort of saying, well, this is within the domain of science. It's within the domain of clinical psychology. It's it's what's within the domain of you know great men like uh, Jung and and Nietzsche or whatever. But it's like yeah, but do you realize that you're going beyond science with that, right? So you're constantly making metaphysical claims and gr- grandiose metaphysical claims, which is fine because maybe those met- those metaphysical claims are true. But then to turn around and act like or assume, no, I'm not actually making any metaphysical claims because I'm only saying something that's about an inner subjective uh, psychological structure or symbolic structure in your mind. That's still a metaphysical claim. That's still saying things about reality. It's still positing you know grand narratives like for example when he does this uh analysis of the tree of life from all these different cultures and then he says, oh this is like a, a not just a psychology of um it's not just a structure of how these ancient people believe the world existed they're actually socio-political structures and they're structures for the person's inner psyche those are big metaphysical claims like this is this is this is going way beyond quote, strict science, you see. But see, so many people don't realize that what they think is, quote, science is actually philosophy and metaphysics. So if you're going to, like, make those kind of claims, but then track back, but then say we don't know how that happened and that there's metaphysics that are beyond the physics we can understand and allude to there being some kind of reality to this and possibly with the problem, hard problem of consciousness, some reality to entities people meet when they're doing psychedelics or active imagination, then you actually, you're, you're an agnostic system that like always thinks there's another God beyond God and you don't know what you're dealing with and continually trying to go beyond your limitation of science that blocks you from something more. Yeah, it's not understanding what metaphysics is and what metaphysical claims are and that you can't do you can't have a worldview because he's always talking about worldviews how can you have a worldview that doesn't have metaphysics it, the, to me it's, it seems preposterous so for example like he's always talking about good and evil and chaos and and potentia those are metaphysical terms what, like how are you using all these terms but assuming the the post enlightenment anti metaphysical stance like, it just doesn't, to me, that makes no sense. In other words, it's divorced from, and I'm not saying he's bad will, it's just that maybe he's not thought about the fact that, like, well, if you were to read, you know, any medieval metaphysical text or Aristotle or Plato, like, you would know what they're talking about is metaphysics, right? I mean, you can't talk about chaos and potentia and good and evil and, and not realize, like, those are metaphysical things. Those are metaphysical questions. Even if you think they're only mental existences or they're only 
you know, inner psychological structures. That's still a metaphysical belief or proposition or, or position. And he says with Bishop Barron that uh, he has metaphysical beliefs. Oh, he does? But he, like he, he, yes, but he feels like he gains more ground and gets more people like started towards that type of thinking, staying in the conciliatory area. Well, I mean, from a pragmatic that, perspective, that's probably true. Because, I mean, you start talking about metaphysics, you're going to immediately lose 90% of your audience. <laughs> so that's probably true. I mean, I mean, the, true from a, from a strategic standpoint, that's probably true. I, I think so, too. But I also have noticed, I think, after you know 10 years of him opening that conversation up, that there's a lot of people who are starting to get the metaphysical con- conversation. Absolutely. And well, you're yeah. people by like J.P. Sears, you know, and what do you mean? And, you know, people making stupid faces on YouTube just because we're seeing real evil at a theological level. Exactly. Yeah. So I don't think we emasculate ourselves of the metaphysical position and apologetics completely either. Right. Which a lot of people think we should do and stick to what he's been doing for 10 years. Yeah. Why would we do that when it's just the next logical step of questioning? Yeah, I totally agree with you. Yeah, I don't think that, yeah, like... I mean, a lot of people have said, oh, you're bad for doing apologetics. You know, it should be the stuff he does. Well, I mean, almost everybody I meet that converts to orthodoxy says, uh, I got into orthodoxy through Jordan Peterson and you. I, I probably heard that 5,000 times in the last five years. I believe it. I, I found you after I converted because I was... I, the dialectical problem, I realized <laughs> like, like how big of a deal it was and i went to go look for james Lindsay again and saw you talking to him that's a good point right there that's a good that's this is an interesting point does he ever address dialectics and i'm, I'm saying that because i don't no, actually know that, no he has and oh, I, it's, it's what he's missing it's what that's that's what he, yeah that would be my thought is that that's what's missing yeah exactly so so if you're gonna go into these metaphysics and stay in that conciliatory area though and take a, a scientific measure of phenomenological experiences like when right. they do the acid trips. Right. And you basically, it's the criticism that uh, Father Seraphim Rose made in his uh, The Soul After Death, that these things are just based upon like how good they make you feel and whether or not they made your life a little bit better. You have like no metaphysical abil- ability to discern the spirit. So what would you say to somebody who's, uh, who, who's engaged in that if you were trying to make a, kind of a friendlier case to them for some plausible way of looking at the Christian metaphysics. Well, again, you're right. So, so the main critique I would have is like, okay, so we're going to say that this is only for uh, pragmatic ends to help us live better. What does it mean to live better? What, in other words, there's no such thing as like a self-evident pragmatism. Th- th- there's going to be some uh, value judgments that are necessitated by even something like pragmatism. I want to live better. Okay, what does that mean? Better, so... Better towards, oriented towards some goal, some telos, some purpose. So we're going to have to have some kind of standards. Well, I'm sorry, but when you start talking about standards, that's getting into the domains of ethics and metaphysics. So when you say, I, I want to look better or worse, that as, assumes the good and the evil, the true and the false. Okay, what is the good, right? I mean, it's just the natural question out of, and that shouldn't be odd. I mean, isn't that what all the ancient philosophers, especially Plato, Socrates, that were asking the question, what is the good? So are we going to have a bunch of just talking media heads say, oh, you can talk about this from a psychology perspective, but don't ask the question what the good is. Well, what if, what if the good is a, a person? What if, it's, what if the logos is a person and not just an abstract concept uh, that helps me, quote, live better? Live better to do what? Live better to be, uh, I mean... Andrew Tate's idea of living better is presumably very different from Jordan Peterson's idea of living better, right? So what does it mean right. to, quote, live better? This is just like empty phraseology. And it's got to have content behind it. Yeah, that's, that's a really good point. It almost seems like he, he, when you've made that case with, with Plato and Socrates asking that, that they end up asking that question, question and even their own ideas of it, they can't figure anything out because it's abstract, right? And then what do they do? Come up with a bunch of social engineer. Yeah, exactly. Like Platonism is uh, plagued with dialectics. Exactly. All, all the Greek philosophers are, you know, struggling with dialectics. So. Yeah. Then you got uh, Pontius Pilate saying, what is truth to Christ when it's right in front of him? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like, 
Same critique that we made of, uh, you know, the Roman Catholic natural theology position where they're always like, oh, well, let's just talk about Logos. And Logos is the same in John 1 as what, uh, you know, Marcus Aurelius talks about. No, it's not. There's a, I mean, the idea, there might be overlap, but it doesn't mean they're the same. The Logos of the pre-Socratics and the Logos of the uh, Stoics is not identical to the Logos of John 1. John 1 has a radical claim that the Logos is a person, a divine person. So yeah, and, that's not natural said, theology. It says everything was created through the Logos and the world knew itself not till he came, right? So those people seeing traces of the Logos wouldn't have had the right conception until the incarnation happened and they exactly. you know, submitted to it. Absolutely. Yeah, well said. Yeah. yeah. People forget that part that the world knew him not, right? Because they always act like, oh, so Plato's got it all figured out. Right? Really? Plato, how come Gregor, say Gregor Palamas because Plato, he says Plato's demonically inspired, right? So he might have said some true things, but I mean, ultimately, at the end of the day, this system is demonic. So, hey man, great points. Do you have anything else you want to say? Uh, I, I did, but no, I kind of, you kind of started talking about some other stuff and kind of blew my mind up a little bit. So I think I'm done. Well, cool, dude. Yeah, anytime, uh, please call in. You, you, I always treasure the um, intelligent uh, callers that have great points to say. So much appreciated there. So let's see. Who's next up that hasn't come in? Uh, Lydia. What's up, Lydia? By the way, 8 o'clock, guys. Remember, one hour. We'll be right back here with Made by Jim Bob, and we'll be getting into um, alternative media figures. Peterson, Tate, and Dawkins. Intellectual, dark web, etc., uh, what, what's, uh, who's the real rebels here and where are they right? Where are they wrong with made by Jim Bob? Did you want to say something, Lydia? I got to unmute. Can you hear? Go ahead. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. First of all, I wanted to say I found you because of the conspiracy theory stuff many, many years ago. So thank you for that. Um, two, you recently met my brother, which I'm a little bit jealous that he's met you in person, but say lovey. Uh-oh. And then the th third thing is, I think these these people like Peterson and different ones, I know in my own journey, I grew up in a cult, I grew up Jehovah's Witness, and I had to unpack a lot of stuff. I think that they are good in the sense of it can get people to think, but I think what happens a lot of times is then people get stuck because then they find just this new leader or this new thing or this new ideology. Like I, I got into a debate one time with a libertarian Christian friend of mine, and I was trying to show her the fallacies of libertarianism and that you you can't say I'm a libertarian and I'm a Christian and hold everybody to a Christian standard and call that libertarianism. And that seemed to be really hard for her to understand. So like I think that some of these guys do good work in the sense of they can reap people whose hearts are maybe like ripe and are, are ready to be harvested. But then I think other people just get stuck in that think tank or in that thing of, oh, this is what it is. This is how I can be the best lobster I can be. And they don't ever grow past that because there's no Christ, because Jesus isn't present in any of that ideology. Yeah, that's a good point. I think that, you know, one of the positives that we could say is that uh, Peterson is definitely opening up the possibilities of considering other options and that for many, many people that has led them in the direction of what, you know, what we talk about. So, uh, but then there is that, yeah, like you said, the possibility of kind of getting stuck in that cul-de-sac of, um, I don't know what, Nietzscheanism, Gnosticism, Carl Jung, Freud. Uh, yeah, that's a great point. Thanks. That's all I had to add. Yeah, thank you, Lydia. Uh, glad to meet your brother. I don't, I'm not sure who your brother was, but glad to have met him. Order of things. What's up, dude? Thank you guys for those super chats. By the way, I didn't realize that uh, I don't have the alert box on the other screen, so that's why your super chats weren't popping up, so they should pop up now. Go ahead and unmute if you want to order of things. Yeah, I, um, I, don't know if you hear me. I do agree with you regarding liberalism, but from a different perspective. Okay. Um, I see that the Enlightenment is actually a challenge to the John 1 um, proposition from that Jesus is the light. 
And and I put it in context of a timeline where um, the Jesus, when he arrived, right, he established his kingdom, and that kingdom was without end. But there was a period of time, a thousand years, that that Satan is restrained, or the enemy is restrained, until he's released. And the Enlightenment age, I see it as um, is that Luciferian light to the world. And uh, it's no incident that if we go back to the narrative of Cain and his tree, who was consumed by the beast, he, um, it is through him that technology and arts and all the kind of civilization aspect. Cain was consumed Cain. by the beast, you said? Well, um, you know, it is, you know, there's, we have, in, in the early, in Genesis, we have two kind of lineages. We have the line of Cain. Yeah, I, I know. His, and, and the technology and, and all that comes to the, to the line of Cain, right? I know what you mean. Yeah. Yeah. And just like in that period, we have the Enlightenment that, uh, that came to the world and it brought with itself the same things that the line of Cain brought. Okay. Furthermore, I see what you're saying. You know, it's a rebirth, and it's a rebirth of the pagan traditions. Yes, um, it, it is a rebirth of paganism. Even the historians of the Enlightenment call it that. Peter Gay has a book on that, yeah. Anyway, so I would agree with, and I don't know if you ever heard of Jeremy Bentham. Sure, yeah. Uh, British uh, yeah. East, he worked with British East India Company, and he was a pro PEDO, and he was the father of the Panopticon, uh, utilitarianism, you bet. Yep. Yeah, so he, the idea of surveillance and the idea of controlling people through surveillance is yep. an ancient idea. Right. And so liberalism is just evolving as it's. And um, I agree. So that's kind of the, that's kind of the time frame the, in the, that I see that. Um. Anyway, so that that's how I see that. Absolutely, dude. Yeah, good points. Uh... We're going to have to move on just because I want to get to the other people that have requested. And we got some super chats. Uh, so I'll go to your call here in a second. Here, we got two or three people in line. Cataclysm, $10. Uh, I'm eager to see your debate with Daniel Hikikachu. I love your work, Jay. Thank you. Yeah, the uh, Hikikachu bait debate is in 41 days. So we got a uh, little ways here. And remind you guys, too, that uh, we have a live event in, in uh, LA. So please go right here and get your ticket. Uh, we are wanting to, Hey, do one of those, this stupid thing. We are wanting to get you out to the event. It's always wanting to go to the edit page. I don't want to go to the edit page. If you go over to my Twitter, it's at the, it's, near the top and Isaac shout out to Isaac for sharing it we also have one of the rappers out in LA interestingly enough <laughs> I was sharing it so I thought that was cool Nick Natoli thank you Nick for sharing it uh, here it is so if you go over here to this link I'll put the link into the chat for you guys <clears throat> get tickets to our event right there Live in Los Angeles, Jamie Kennedy, my wife, Jamie Hanshaw, and me. Five hours of philosophy, comedy, lecture, book signing, all of that. It's going to be a lot of fun right there. July 6th in Los Angeles. Where is everybody at? Where y'all at? Get your tickets right there. Now, go. Get them. Be good boys and girls. Be good Chad nerds. And get your tickets. Also, we got another super chat here from AC, $5. Leibniz is a better classical liberal. What are the errors that lead him to be so amenable to Carl Jung and Corbin in a manner subversive to Christianity? So I think you asked, okay, so AC asked that question before he called in. So that's got to be the same AC. So yeah, great, great comments by AC today. I really appreciate those. AC says again for $10, Plato called for oligarchy. Um, a bunch of Kumari, uh, social engineering conspiracy. Exactly. And then everybody says, you don't understand Plato. It's all allegory. Yeah, right. Well, even if it's all allegory, I mean, obviously many 
Marxist socialists and oligarchs have taken Plato's manual as a manual. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, great comments there from AC. Uh, Walter, 1998, you said that there's nothing to chaos theory. I don't have any, I mean, so first of all, chaos theory, as I understand it in terms of physics, would be outright a denial of divine providence. So I disagree with that. If you mean chaos theory the way Jordan Peterson presents it, I think we critiqued it in terms of like the dualistic assumptions and the um, lack of metaphysical clarity distinguishing chaos from evil, disorder, and potentia, right? Th those are different things. So are you worried that the about the exponential cascade scenario we discussed? Uh, I'm not sure what that means. Dr. Vad just sold $1. How do atheists get past the fact that you can't have a big bang without time or space? Uh, I mean, a lot of times I've heard him just say, we just don't know. Uh, and, but they'll say, but this, this is the best sort of explanation or story that we have. If all non-existent matter was compressed, it would be the hottest point ever and would only emit a super fine sterile dust. Yeah, but I mean, come on, let's just be honest here. Like the big bang is a an atheist creation miracle narrative, obviously. Kristen, $15. Here's a donat donation for a V05 hot oil treatment for the luxurious mane. Actually, Jamie has put a, a oil treatment on my head. She was like, let me do that. And I was like, okay. It wasn't V05 because it ain't the year 1993. But, I mean, we're going to be surpassing. We've already surpassed uh, Matthew McConaughey. So eventually we'll just have a giant bush up here. Also get a pack of Virginia Slim Ultralight 120s. Uh, only if you give me a box wine and allow me to become a wine mom. Gary, $25. What do you think about Jordan Peterson's genuine beliefs and agenda? Is he confused or does he have ulterior motives? Um, I don't judge the motives because I don't know those things, right? I don't have access to people's interior dispositions and that kind of stuff. And I, I get really annoyed when people do the really lazy thing where they're just, because they do it to me all the time. They're like, I'm not really interested in digging into what he says. I don't care if what he says is true. I'm not going to look at his claims. I'm not going to look at the evidence, the books that he talks about. I'm just going to figure out a way that I can decide he's a bad person. That's what most people do, and that drives me crazy because it's so lazy and just soy to do that. But most people do that. So I'm not going to do that. So I don't have any, no idea what his motives are. I don't have any theor conspiracy theories about any of that. Um, I'm only going to go by the objective argumentation and claims that I hear people saying. And I try to do that with everybody. So, uh, you know, like, even even the Tates, people are like, how come you're not uh, condemning Tate for his moral positions? And I'm like, well, I have disagreed and critiqued his moral positions. But interestingly, and I don't know his motives. He might have bad motives. But of the red pill sphere of all these people and all the alternative media sphere... It is interesting to me that the only ones that will mention or give even verbal credence to, quote, conspiracy are uh, Lord Voldemort and Tate's. And I guess now we could count Tucker in that. Uh, Rogan, he doesn't, he used to go there. He doesn't really like to go there, it looks like. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I just feel like motives are things you can never really know unless you get really hard evidence of like, you know, somebody sending a text message that's authentic or, or, you know, I got video of, you know, I got video of Jay saying, uh, I secretly hate everyone and I'm not a Christian and I'm not Orthodox and I want to dupe everybody. Like, unless that exists, <laughs> right? Like, how do you know the people's motives from the freaking internet, right? I mean, it's hard enough to figure out people's motives in real life. How are you going to figure it out from the internet now? So what's the better approach? Well, what are they actually saying? That's that's how I operate. Giga Lobster Supreme 420. Thank you, Base Chad Nerd five dollars. Thank you, dude. Giga Lobster Supreme 420 five dollars. What's your best video refuting determinism? 
Uh, it seems like we've had a lot of people call in, and we make the we just make the naturalist fallacy argument. So actually, the JF debate that's that's ultimately what the JF debate ended up being because he was like, I am a determinist, I am a machine, and so I just made the argument that well, if that's the case, then arguments not possible, right? Because argumentation presupposes that you have agency, that you're making these arguments. And you're not just chemically determined to do so, right? And if everything's chemically or, uh, you know, causally determined, then there's absolutely no qualitative difference between the true or the false. So this will basically destroy the possibility of argumentation or logic or proving or disproving anything at all. Because everything is ultimately just equalized as the effect of random indeterminate chemical reactions. Or excuse me, random determinate chemical reactions. So uh, now all meaning and truth claims have been destroyed. So that's the, I think that's a total refutation of determinism. Ben Jackson, uh, what's up, dude? Unmute. Yeah, sorry. Um, what's up, Jane? Hey. So, so yeah, so. I don't even know how to explain this because it's so ridiculous in retrospect, but I'm an Orthodox Christian, but I've been very confused lately about Nietzschean and Jungian ideas. Um, uh, because of Jordan Peterson, I sort of stopped having the correct take on Nietzsche, which is that he's explicitly and deliberately anti-Christian. And I sort of convinced myself that Nietzsche was responding to a sort of milk toast, incorrect version of Christianity. Yeah, I, I think that's true. No, I think that's true. I think Nietzsche is, if you think about liberal, higher critical German Protestant Christianity or even Roman Catholicism, I think uh, Nietzsche has good cr critiques. Right. But so because I was seeing it that way, I kind of got caught up in a lot of his ideas that I think I'd better get away from because I think they're probably not not correct. Specifically, will to power. Well, um, let's remember that Nietzsche is a perspectivalist, right? So he doesn't think there's objective truth. So that's kind of like easily self-refuting on its face. Oh, oh, I didn't know that, but you're you're right. That yeah. it, that's something that it's very easy for me to see that is incorrect. But, um, you see, but the, th the problem that I have, well, I don't know if I should say it's a problem, but my confusion about Orthodox Christianity is, um, it seems like the only denomination that's very clear and has a clear idea that we are meant to always have bodies, right? I think that there's a sort of Gnostic d dislike of your own body or, or trying to go away, like people people in the west who are like really humble by sexuality and things like that i see less of that in orthodox christians which i think is good but um and that was a critique that was a critique of how it works sorry. i still don't understand how it works with the asceticism that's really confusing to me because like i don't want to be celibate i understand that i'm allowed to be married and that's great, good, and I'm glad, and I'm grateful. But at the same time, I feel like a lot of people have the attitude that married people, well, they can't really be great saints, or they can't really know God if you're like a, a sexual being. But does, it, like, does that make sense? Like, how, like nobody does sports. That's a saint. No, you know, they, they they try to pretend like the the monastic saints are better. So how are we not supposed to hate our bodies if this is the message from the religion? Does that question make sense? I think that's a fair question, and it's a good critique uh, in the sense of there can be times when the, the zeal for asceticism becomes damaging, and it actually becomes a, a basis for prelest. So there are there are elders who actually make your argument and say that the idea that asceticism itself is somehow higher is not true, and there are plenty of married people who you know um, attain to high levels of sanctity and, and theosis. So um, I think that's, I think those are fair points as long as it's understood that asceticism is not an end in itself. 
and it's also not uh, destroying the body because that would be ultimately a denial of being made in the image of God. It's just that putting it, it's supposed to be, I think, in its right, in the right place or, or in the right hierarchy, right? So it's like the body isn't the most important thing, but it does matter and we shouldn't negate it or, or think it's evil. So but I think that's a fair, that's a fair point. But yeah, but with the six But hold on, there are there are, by the way, there may not be sports heroes because I mean prior to yeah. the like prior to the twentieth century, sports was seen as something that you grew out of. It was for kids. So but there are, but I mean you do have uh plenty of saints who were kings and warriors. So what I do is martial arts, which has somewhat of a different goal than just winning competitions, although that's part of it. But I also feel like the, the better I get at the martial arts, the better I understand my own body and human bodies in general. And I think that's a good thing to yeah, do. Yeah, of course. I mean, I, I've been saying for a long time, like, if we're not going to honor the warrior saints and whatnot, then it's basically just rejecting the history of, of Christianity and the church. I mean, I agree. Yeah, Okay, good. So what I did, what I need to do now is to get this will to power out of my heart and out of my soul and to find a, a way to carry on doing the martial arts and the Christianity, but without trying to make myself more powerful, maybe. Why? Well, why, why is, is that it bad? Like, to it's power because no, what, it seems again, like I need power to do what I need my, to accomplish my goals. Yeah, why would it be wrong to seek physical fitness or, or power? Or I mean, what, I don't see why that would be wrong. Well, I'm just trying to understand to what extent Nietzsche is is leading us away from... Because I read The Speak Zarathustra, and obviously we can all agree that the replacing God is wrong because, well, you and I, we both believe in God. But... Is he also wrong about trying to make yourself the most powerful version of yourself that you can be? Or is that okay? I think it really comes down to the reason or the ends for which you're doing those things. I mean, I think for Nietzscheanism, you are an end in yourself. And in, in Christianity or Orthodoxy, you're not an end in yourself. There's a higher calling for which those things can be good and useful. But they're, in fact, misused if they're used to be an end in yourself, right? Like, if it's only for the purpose of self-aggrandizement, that's not ultimately going to fulfill you in its vanity. And it's going to make you miserable. But if it's for the purpose of um, being the best that you can be in the image of God, then I don't see, the, I don't see why any of that's bad. Okay, great. That, that's very good to hear. Um, okay, that's all I got. Thanks, Jake. Yeah, good points, yeah. Fair questions too. I think we can ask those questions. Um, uh, we're gonna. I'm gonna give one more baby burrito, and then I gotta get ready for the Jim Bob interview that we're gonna do here in a little bit. What's up, baby burrito? Hello. Hey. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Hi. Hi this is uh, this is actually uh, Nick Nick Anonymous. Uh, I've called in, uh, I'm a writer, researcher, uh, and a journalist. I'm not really a, I, I fancy myself a, a political expert and a, a historic history expert, Okay. but not really in philosophy. So, uh, but I, I, I am a libertarian, so uh, I'm coming from a libertarian humanist point of view and are uh, not but i'm also a christian so it's like a christian classical liberal hu humanist point of view okay right and i just want to know um what 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 where your stance is are you more like a uh a, a, a theocratic mo uh, monarchist yeah okay so you you advocate for theocracy I don't, I mean, not like right now, like let's take over the government and make me the king. But I mean, in a society where the majority is Orthodox Christian, yeah, historically that's always manifested as a monarchical form of government. Okay. So my, my, my uh, I make, I make the argument that we live in a, a classical liberal society and that 
anything in that everything is based off of classical liberalism. That's we, true. Uh, yeah, that's true. The, uh, without liberalism or classical liberalism, we wouldn't even there would be no such thing as debate, and we wouldn't even be able to have this conversation right now because of it would be looked at looked at as almost unholy. Or and, and I don't I don't agree. So with you think that, before that, you think before the Enlightenment, people didn't have public debate. Uh, I, I believe they, they didn't have truly free debate. I believe they had, uh, you could, you could not debate some things. Well, hold example, on. What, 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 what is it? Or, well, what's truly, what, 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 what mean, what is, what's meant by quote, truly free debate? Like anything? Literally anything. Yes. That <clears throat> throughout the uh, liberal society, we've debated absolutely everything, including the, ch- the, the rights and wrongs of the church. And I don't agree that we can write things off like for example uh the murder of joan of arc the murder of martin luther and uh the spanish inquisition um and the, the murder of the cathars under the church and the theocracy and, okay. and the problem with with theocratic institutions and the theocracies like in iran right now is a theocracy so anybody who advocates for that is advocating for what Iran has done, I, but that's a separate issue, and I don't want. Okay, to so uh, I mean, implicit in this is that it's wrong to um, do violence to people, or that the state shouldn't have uh, the death penalty, or something like that. Like, on what basis? Like, why is that wrong? Maybe it is, well, but why? The problem is, is that you, you get to a point where people be begin to be called heretics and and i understand that and i'm asking okay but i'm asking why is that wrong to murder thousands of people and calling them heretics be able to call label people heretics and murder them by the thousands i think was wrong and i can't write off all the evil things that the church did and the main reason is is this is the third time this is the third is actually this is the third are you listening it's the third time you've stated the position and i'm asking you why is it wrong because it is it is wrong because so it's wrong it because it's wrong. death and murder. So it's wrong to kill because it leads to death and murder. Yeah, exactly. It, Do you understand? Maybe this is why no, people. No, you understand? This is why people don't. Because of the church, because it's a it's a sin. But the church has sinned for a thousand years. Again, for millennia. The church has killed thousands oh and thousands of people. Well, first of all, the you church the church did not kill it, thousands and thousands of people. So in the, the, the pope, the pope and the theocracy and the king, which were the church, the church and the kingdom were married, were absolutely. It's not. It's not even true. So again, right. So if if you read Henry Common's book on the Middle Ages, the Spanish Inquisition might have killed a few thousand people, but that's not the Pope's Inquisition. That's two different Inquisitions. What Furthermore, what about, the cat, uh, what about the Cathars? Do you write the the, Cathar, the, the death of all the thousands of Gnostic Cathars? Do you write that off? No, I've, I've lectured through Malcolm Lambert's entire 600 page book on this point. And no, there probably were uh, maybe a few thousand of those people killed. That's plausible. Okay, what about Martin Luther? You mean Martin Luther had people killed? Yeah. <laughs> what? No, I mean with the death of Martin Luther wasn't. Well, I mean Martin Luther had Anabaptists killed. killed. You you didn't know that, huh? Martin Luther had Anabaptists put to death. You didn't know that. Okay, well he was put to death. Okay, what about Joan of Arc? I mean, I don't have any any opinion on Joan of Arc per se. I think she seems like a lunatic to me, but. Joan of Arc saved the kingdom of France from. I know who she is. I know what she did. France but today, if there was not Joan of Arc, no, bro, France. I know that. I just told you I lectured, lectured through a six hundred page book on medieval France and its heresies. I know what Joan of Arc did. I used to be a Roman Catholic, but what I'm saying is, is that what does that have to do with the basis for whether it's right or wrong? You understand? That's a different question. I'm not asking you. You think there's church abuses? Okay, but. That's a different question from what is the basis for saying that it is wrong for the state to put, put people to death? Maybe you're right, but I want to know what the basis for that is. Why is that wrong? The basis is is because uh, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Okay, so because- you're going to use cliche phrases from, uh, I think, who Dollinger or Lord Acton at the time of Vatican I? 
Right. So right. it's so it's, cliche. It's not cliche that, that it's it not is a really cliche. Great it's the definite. It's, it's, it is a so cliche let me, phrase. Let me, let me, let me talk it's like, literally let me a cliche. Point. So citing a cliche is not going to justify the principle. Maybe it's true, but it's just restating your point. Let, let me make a, let, let me make another point. Do you understand okay, what it means to? Me to you, you're not. Listen, listen, do you know what it means listen. to justify a claim? Do you know what that means? Okay. Well, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna say I, let me let me say another another point. Okay. Do you, Do you know what it means to justify a claim in terms of like how, philosophy? How can you How can you determine if somebody really? So has here we have. So it never fails. It never fails. How can you, when we how ask can you specific know? questions people melt down and they don't know what we're talking about. I'm asking a really simple, specific, philosophical question. How do you justify the claim or the belief that it is wrong for the state to murder people? I already conceded, maybe you're right, maybe it is. But I wanna know why you appeal to a cliche. That's not a justification. It's, it's wrong to the, because it's a sin. <laughs> well, now wait a minute. You said that you don't believe in the church, right? So you, I, never, I never said I don't believe in the church. No, I did not say that. You said you don't. No, yes, you did. You said the church in history. So theocracy. I never said I did not. You said the church in history, and to me, that's the only church that exists. There's no other churches. I mean, maybe you think you're part of one somewhere that you've made up. I don't know, but there's the, there's the Eastern Orthodox Church. There's a Roman Catholic Church. There's a Protestant Church. Yeah, did, did it, they, they don't mosques, teach. They don't uh, uh, synagogues. They don't teach churches. They don't teach synagogues aren't churches. They don't teach classical liberalism. The first thousand years of Christianity doesn't teach classical liberalism. So you're talking about some Protestant thing, right? Well, I have another question for you. Do you think that the Pope should be able to have Too his own kingdom it. and run run the kingdom off of the, the Roman Catholic Church the way it is today? No, I'm Orthodox. I'm not a papist. That's a two quote way, by the way. Okay, so if there was a pope-like figure within the Orthodox, and if in, in a theocracy, so a hypothetical. Have... Uh, let me give a hypothetical situation where there was. What if the, the Orthodox had a pope? My question was, how do you justify the claim that it's wrong for the state to kill? And you've given a bunch of statements and phrases about the history of this church and that church. Again, what's the? You said it's it's wrong for the state to do that because it's wrong for the state to kill. But in Romans 13, Paul says the state has the sword to kill. I, I'm not arguing for it's that it's wrong. To, I, it's wrong for the state to kill. I think it's wrong. For you, the oh my God. you literally said that the basis of heresy. I think that is wrong. And it goes against the actual religion that it's advocating for. Now, uh, how, state, how do you, how do you determine that? So it's wrong to, for the state to kill on the basis of heresy, but it's okay for the state to kill on what moral things? Well, capital punishment, we, we, the state kills people every day. I'm not advocating against. I asked why it's wrong or right. You just get, you state, you're stating what things are the case. I'm asking for why it's wrong or wrong, right or wrong. It's, it's because there are, uh, plenty of examples throughout history. Why a theocratic state, uh, That's just presuming your position is correct. I don't. I'm not. I'm not against capital punishment. I, I'm not advocating against capital punishment. I. I don't think it's wrong for the state okay. to kill. That's nice that so, you think yes, that. On what basis? I don't think it's wrong for the state to kill. I will agree with you that it's right. Do, for do the you state know what it means to give an argument and a justification for the position? It doesn't mean just keep telling me your position. Do you understand what it means? We can all, yeah, right. I'm not trying to be mean to you, but I have to go. Sorry. So you can call back in later. Uh, we're going to do the show with Jim Bob here in about 20 minutes. Thank you, guys. Everybody have a good night. I'll see you in 30 minutes. Also, remember to get your tickets. Also, remember to head on over to chalk.com, chok.com. Use the promo code J50. to get 50% off all of those excellent products like the Tonkat Ali, my favorite. J-A-Y-50. That's J-A-Y-5-0. 50% off chalk at chalk.com or use the promo code J53 life. That's J53 